All right, welcome to the July 18th Bristol Energy Committee meeting. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we're going to go right to our scheduled appointment, uh, Dwight DeCoster, uh, which is, give me your organization with whole name. Everything is uh, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, which is CDOO, and we are the weatherization portion, we're one of nine programs for CDOO. And yes, it did take me about a month to remember how to say that, so. Excellent. Well, yeah. you have the floor. All right, well, if, uh, I'm projecting it up yeah. there, but I have six copies there if anybody wants one. One and only one in color. Um, I'm colorblind, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so as I said before, my name is Dwight Foster. I have been the uh, weatherization director for about two years after retiring like, out of the military in Vermont National Guard after 30. Um, and so thank you for your service. I am down here tonight representing this group of folks right here. Uh, some of these are from some of our folks that saw ourselves as Lincoln and Virgins. But uh, 25 of our folks, a few missing there, and one of our two canine support staff. Now, uh, this was taken July 3rd when we were end of year celebration. We just spent two months really hammering away to get to the end of our contract. So. Um, moving on, and if you have any questions at all during this, just stop and ask me and I'll do my best to answer. So the purpose of the Vermont uh, Weatherization Program, Vermont Low Income Weatherization Assistance Program is there to create warmer, safer, healthier, and more energy efficient homes. Energy efficiency being the key uh, portion of that, the rest of it uh, is a benefit and we want to make sure that all three of those things happen along with it. We don't want to do our work and create an unhealthy, unsafe home, um, which a lot of our homes are already set. So it's an anti-poverty program that's been around about 36 years. Uh, it was started in the energy crunch. that um, puts money saved via energy efficiency back into the pockets of low-income Vermonters. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that. It, how is it implemented? Uh, DCF's Office of Economic Opportunity, or OEO, uh, administers the statewide program. They have three full-time employees that provide guidance, training, quality control, and quality assurance to the program. And most importantly, they are our funders, uh, one of two uh, major funders that our program has. It's implemented in the field at my level. Uh, we have four community action agencies. Everybody familiar with community action agencies? Uh, one being Bennington Rutland Opportunity Council, one being Capstone. Some of you may remember it's Champlain, or, excuse me, Central Vermont Community Action. Uh, ourselves, CBOEO, we have three offices. We're located in Burlington, we're located in St. Albans, as well as uh, Middlebury. And SEPCA, Southeast Vermont Community Action, they're down in uh, Westminster. And then one anomaly is that uh, one employee training organization, Northeast Training Organization, NEDO, out of the St. Johnsbury, Newport area, they uh, provide the service in the field. They do none of the other community action. They're just weatherization providers. Uh, Northeast Kingdom Community Action does not serve this program. So, all right, how are we funded? That's a big, big thing. 85% or about $2.1 million a year program year, which our program year runs from July through June, or that's equivalent to 184 homes worth of work, uh, is through the Vermont Home Weatherization Assistance Program, which is funded through a tax on all heating fuels. Um, 15, and that's just CDOEO's portion, and we're the largest in the state because we, we cover Franklin, Grand Isle, Addison, and Chittenden. 15% um, of that, and this is the good news, Contrary to um, what the current administration was looking at, DOE was actually, we actually got an increase of the ability to do two more homes this year. So we're up to 330,000 or 31 homes, their DOE grant. And that, like I said, that's two more houses that we're able to reach out with, with Department of Energy money. <clears throat> Various other grants that we work on are VLIGHT, which is Vermont Low Income Trust. Um, uh, they spun out of, as I understand it, they spun out of the GMP, what was going to be the GMP 
and I can't remember the other one right now, a larger um, uh, public ut utility. And this was their feel good group. They're out there putting out a lot of good money. Uh, we've done a lot of wood, changing out old wood stoves to putting in some pellet stoves. They've also given us a lot of money for the next piece, which is a huge thing for us, is vermiculite. Vermiculite is an asbestos containing uh, material that came from the Libby Mine. Uh, I don't know if everybody's heard of the Libby Mine, but it's a Libby, Montana's property values are very low due to the asbestos contamination out there in that mine. We do have a little bit of money that comes from a private grant organization called Argosy. And I'll explain a little bit where we use their money. Vermont Gas, as I said, I was talking a little bit earlier, they're a partner of ours. Um, they did 84 of the homes with us last year out of the 214 that we did. And we are the low income implementer for Efficiency Vermont's energy efficiency program. So we should do a lot of uh, demand side management for them uh, in the field. But what was that? What was that you last said about efficiency Vermont? Excuse me. What What did you last say about efficiency? We are the in the field implementer for them for the low income side. Oh, okay, I guess. So we do a lot of demand side management uh, and reduction for them in the field. Uh, refrigerators, freezers. Um, there's uh, we've, we've done horse waterers that have been huge energy. Uh, our energy pigs. We do. We've done a goat house that they heated a certain temperature that was just, you know, barn board. So efficiency from us. And they sound odd, but they're hugely uh, huge energy pigs. Uh, water beds are another one. Every time I approve a send a water a new mattress forward to my di executive director to replace a water bed, she's like, "What? Did the guys ruin a bed? No, <laughs> we have to. It's a water bed. Um, so, yeah." place a lot of inefficient lighting. Uh, I'm learning these things. So who are our clients? Our clients are Vermont homeowners and renters with household incomes below 80% of the area median income, which is set by HUD. Um, and we just got our new rates for this program year, and they went up significantly. They went up by about 10%. So uh, that's a good thing, because a lot of our, the line is kind of drawn at the bottom um, halfway through the working, those that are working two jobs and struggling, that's where the line was drawn. So now it's gone up and including more than. So what's that point now? It's gone up 10 percent. I will show. I have another slide that's going to talk about that. It's based on family size, so we'll get to that. Or 200 percent of the federal poverty limit for those DOE jobs that we do, and this service is provided at no cost to the the clients themselves. Um, for those that are income eligible. And or uh, make one little caveat here. When we, we do work for uh, property owners, but they are required to do the health and safety work, uh, anything that's electrical, any, you know, anything that's keeping us from doing the work, the work on the furnace, and then we will work with them and do the efficiency measures. So, so. How, how big a part is that then in terms of? Uh, I would say it's probably about a third of our jobs. Uh, yeah. So we, since I've come on board, when I came on board two years ago, we had a four-year waiting list. And we've worked extremely hard to ensure, and we've prioritized single, you know, the, 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 the non-renters, you know, the owners much more. And I'm really happy to say that, that waiting list is now under two years. We really, and we're at the point now where we're, you know, advertise while you're busy. So we're doing a little bit of outreach this summer to 400 of the folks that are on the fuel assistance list to get them to, there's a line of fuel assistance that by agreeing to fuel assistance, you are agreeing that you will go through the weatherization program uh, as well, so. Mm -hmm. um, so the waiting list is because there aren't enough people to do it, or it's, it's constrained by the money available? It was constrained by the money available is the biggest portion. Yeah. Yep. Um, and the legislature took on some of that last year, and they, they got to the 80% and above folks with some work. Um, and we've been working with them through the Governor's Climate Action Committee to <clears throat> try to figure out where what's what's doable with Vermont's workforce. And I will say that's a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the largest challenges we face is um, I'm interviewing three people for one crew job. 
on Friday, and only one of them is a Vermonter from Vermont. The other two are folks that we know that want to move to Vermont, and they're friends of some of our crew members. So two out of the three are non-Vermonters that we're looking to bring in. So, so that, so, okay, so the, P, so the contractors are also a huge limit. The contractors, and, and, I'll, and I'll get to that at okay. the end. I kind of said what are our, so I'll, okay. I'll save that question yeah. for the end. Great. Um, we do prioritize by uh, following criteria. We have what's called the WAP rank. Uh, fuel assistance, my heap homes, they get the fuel assistance money. They're obviously somebody that we want to um, focus on. Household income less than 60% of the SMI is, is what we're getting after. And then 30% of SMI. Our area median income, state median income, our priority is even more because those are the, um, you know, you get a lot, we get a lot of single older ladies living on Social Security that are $12,000. That's where, we're, where we want to go. And it keeps Vermonters at home. Um, high energy use, they get a, uh, some points. Families with elderly in the home, they get points. Disabled members in the household points. And children under six, yeah, extra points. So, uh, so I'm sorry this is a little bit small to get it on there. Uh, eligibility, eligibility income guidelines, and these are hard and fast numbers, but not all income is in here. So some income is, some isn't. Um, disability, most disability incomes are not included in this. Social Security is. Uh, pensions are. Um, earned income is. So. You'll see that for a household of one in Addison County, and this is 80%. And again, so I remember I said 60% is what we're prioritizing. Right. So that's 80%. Addison County is slightly lower than the other three counties, as you'll notice. But um, we don't turn a lot. We don't. We have a stringent eligibility process that we go through that takes a lot of time because uh, we have to document all that. We have to document that they are the homeowner. We have to document their fuel usage. We have to document. The, the, where their income comes from. So, so <clears throat> about Chittenden, Franklin, Grand Isle are higher. Addison County is lower, but that again is about a 10% or excuse me, five, a 10% change in that number this year, which like I said, we're excited about. So, um, so how does it work? How does the program work? This is kind of a circular affair with the goal in the middle of having safe, warm, healthy, and more efficient homes. Intake and eligibility, I talked about that. They apply, and if anybody wants to see an application, or you have a neighbor that you think will qualify, they're right there. Um, and then they come back, and Deborah Jira in our office goes through the whole process with the person and makes and determines whether they're, they're eligible. Um, the worst thing we have to do is occasionally tell somebody they're five, $600 over. Um, so. Uh, then the first step in actually at the client's home is the efficiency coaching. And I talked about before, that's where they, we could do the energy demand uh, reduction. We go out and we have an electrical auditor that he's looking at all the electrical use in the house, whatever they're using. And can we put a more efficient appliance into that home? And usually it's a refrigerator, sometimes a freezer, maybe you know, a washer, those sorts of things. Um, and it's really... And, like lighting, the horse water, the, you know, the goat house, things like that. But we, do, um, we attempt to get them, we, it's also, the next step of that is also a lot of behavioral yeah. coaching. I mean, that's a two to three hour visit right there, and a lot of it is on behavior. This is, and we're not, you must get rid of your hot tub. Yeah. We are like, you know, it, how did, when you do wash, do you do a full load or a partial load? How many loads of the, you know, and dishwashers and you know, all that stuff. So a lot of behavioral coaching goes on there. Um, so we had one, it was in Burlington, 18,000 kilowatt hours for a mobile home. Huh? 18,000 kilowatts. 12,000 of it was thermal, the thermal load. But yeah, so we went in there, worked with VED, got a new heating system in there, and now they're down to about four. So geez. And including the refrigerator and some other stuff. Um, so that's the, the, the demand, that's the electrical side, and then at the energy audit, we go in and we do a thorough uh, top to bottom, test, 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 combustion testing, how leaky is the house with a blower door, has everybody seen a blower door? Yeah. 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 That's, that changed, that revolutionized what we do, 
in the like the 2000 era, 1998. Right. That was revolutionary. Um, and then we write up a complete audit. Everything that can is uh, cost efficient. We use savings to invest savings to investment ratio SIR or return on investment ROI of one to one. If over the life of the measure, if it will save, you know, we'll get one dollar. We'll do it. Um, mm -hmm. So to complete audit, we, we use a, a lot of we use a black box, punch it out, and the black box says what's, what the savings are going to be. And, and uh, but it's very thorough. About a one day time, they're in the house. Depending on the house, four to six hours. And then it usually takes them about an eight hour audit, which is about an eight hour day to write up the audit and make sure everything goes. So then it goes into production and an energy retrofit where our, our own crews, we use crew labor. We have uh, 12 on our staff. That's broken down into five crew members, five crews, and they go out and do all the work in-house. Um, one of the things we don't do in-house uh, uh, is a lot of like, I'll get to it a little bit later, but roofing, any repairs, we sub out. Um, we used to sub out 100% of our uh, heating contractor work but we brought an energy uh, heating technician on board so that we could be more efficient. That waiting list I talk about, if you've ever tried to get a contractor in your house right now, that was part of why our waiting list. So our, we would wait sometimes three months for a cleaning tune on a furnace before. Right. Now it's less than two weeks. So uh, that was really well. Health and safety work is going on at the same time. So ventilation, moisture control, uh, if there's any you know, electrical deficiencies in the wiring, um, and I'll talk a little bit about some deferral stuff, but you know, ventilation and moisture control are real big ones. Indoor air quality, um, reducing anything that has CO, is producing CO is, is critical. We actually had a lady in, your, in, in Addison County that we just finished, and we went back, back out to mon with the state to monitor it, and she had an atmospheric gas hot water heater in her kitchen that had, she had been asking a local contractor, is this safe? For 35 years that she's owned the house, it's the same one. She had headaches for the last 20 years. And they kept telling her it was safe. We yanked it out. We put in an uh, air source heat pump automator in the basement. Miraculously, the headaches went away in a week. So, um, but she was pleased. Yeah, you know, she's ecstatic. Um, so once all the work is done, the final thing is the quality control inspection. I have a quality control inspector that I that lives in Lincoln. Uh, I say, Larry, if you can't go to bed at night, I don't want you to sign off on the job. So about 20% of the jobs, we're going back to make some minor adjustment or something that we missed or something. And I don't, I will never, I told him this, I said I will never ask you to sign a job. And to this day I haven't in two years, but he wouldn't let me because that's his, you know, he needs, he, he needs to go to bed at night to make everybody safe. Because we, we do our work wrong, we can kill somebody. Right. So, uh, here's one of our installers, uh, open blow cellulose in an attic. We go to R50 right now, but we're debating, we're, we're talking tomorrow about possibly going to R60 in the attics. Um, the incremental is very small. Well, uh, the rules, DOE rules say R50, but we make, once in a while it makes sense, we change Vermont rules and make them more stringent than DOE. So. Do you use a combination of insulations or is it mainly cellulose? We use cellulose where it makes sense. We use a lot of fiberglass in mobile homes or in areas where there's potential for that insulation to get wet. Because this, will, this is a sponge and this will soak and get wet and the first time you're going to notice that you have a problem is when your ceiling comes down while you're watching TV or something. So in any case where we're worried about it, in a mobile home, top and bottom, yeah. uh, we use fiberglass because it's more forgiving and lighter weight. Do you, so, do you work on with the spray foams as well? We use some two-part foam, and we do have spray rigs to spray that, but it's very spent expensive, and we have some other techniques that we can use to do it with. Okay. Um, so what is the impact of this work? Statewide, in the past six years, we've done 6,687 homes amongst the five agencies. 900 homes in the past program year, which we just wrapped up, of which we did 214 of them in uh, our territory. The average cost of the job that we spend is $8,500. 
twelve percent of that goes to basically the health and safety, that work that I talked about, and the estimated savings of twenty four percent per home on average. So we're basically saving a quarter of the bill. So is there is there always a health and safety aspect because of the age of the homes or the kind of homes? There is a we there is always a health and safety aspect because we do a cleaning too before we go into any home or we require the renter, the property owner to do a cleaning too. Right. Um, but we find that almost every house is lacking in ventilation. So we go by ASHRAE 622, which requires us to have a certain amount of, based on the tightness limit of the house, we have a certain amount of uh, ventilation that it requires. And what do you, so what would you use? We are unfortunately right now only allowed to use point exhaust. Which brings up some other challenges. Yeah. So kitchen cost. What's that? Is that because of the cost of doing it? It is because of the cost. Once you get into an HRV or uh, energy recovery ventilation system, heat recovery ventilation system, I mean, just look at what those cost. I mean, just the materials are yeah. a thousand plus. Most of them are ducted, yeah. so it's really challenging to do it and be cost effective. And the DOE rules use ASHRAE, so we 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 know, but at the same time. When we put a required amount of ventilation in, oftentimes we backdraft a heating appliance. Or we do a worst case scenario on every home, sometimes daily, where we put on every appliance that sucks air out of, that exhausts air out of the building. Kitchen uh, gen airs, kitchen, kitchen exhaust, uh, dryers exhaust, a ton of air, um, any bath fans. We turn all that on at once and then see what the, what the heating appliances do or the water heater. And we don't leave them unless you know, they have to have a right. negative draft or they're or we're not we're doing more work. And that may include up to uh, changing out the heating system to a direct fan type heating system. Right. And what's what's the I guess the makeup of the homes that you're doing, you know, as in stick built or mobile home, like is there is there one majority over another because of because of the income area that you're in or mobile homes are an inexpensive good way for some folks to live yeah. and it's very inexpensive unless until you come to the energy bills um, energy bills sometimes is two to three times the amount of the lot rent um, so I, I would say it's basically one-third mobile homes two-thirds stick and then you throw your multifamilies in there as well yeah. so okay um, and with some module I mean we take a brand new module home and we still put a, we can still put eighty five hundred dollars into it just like that because they're not, you know. Yeah. And Who's then, enforcing that code anyway? What's that? Who's enforcing that energy code yeah. anyway? So we went into one the other day. It's only ten years old, and we get in there. We do top of the building work first. Well, there was a, about a two foot square hole around the chimney chase going directly into the attic if you did here. Mm. Okay. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah, we save about a quarter on average. Some of them are much greater. Some of them are not as much. Mobile homes tend to be slightly lower on the on the savings, just because uh, what your uh, what the structure is. What's the um, what's the I guess it's not payback time, but the longevity of the systems that you're putting in. Do you have a certain. It depends on the years. Okay. Each measure has a different um, longevity. Like we put on Q lines and door sweeps. You know, weather stripping and door sweeps. They have a lower lifetime because it's in a high traffic area. Yada 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 than cellulose in the attic and in the walls. Right. That's pretty much there. You know, I think we use a 20 year payback for that. Okay. So, um, yeah, two part foam does have some, you know, a little bit less life. Yeah. So, but all those tools are used in conjunction to do the best job. Um, impact locally, like I said, the program year 18, we just wrapped up. We weatherized 213 homes in Franklin, with Grand Isle, and in Madison County. Right now, it's our summer months. We're located in Colchester. So our summer months, we do a lot of work in the south, down here in Madison County. So we'll probably spend most of the summer down here uh, working on those homes, just because of the driving conditions and, and the distance. I mean, driving in the winter all the way to Orwell, on Route 7, that's a, that's a bit of a haul every day. So did you say in the last slide you did 900 homes for the year? That was amongst all five. Oh, all five. Okay. Actually, so this is your This agencies. is just our portion. Gotcha. Yeah, and we're there usually anywhere from two to six days, depending on the home. And your estimate for 2019? 2019 is uh, we, we got um, 
two more DOE units. So we're going to do 100, I'm planning to do 184 HWAP units and 31 um, DOE units. So my math's fuzzy right now. 215. Two yeah, 215. So. What are some of the biggest challenges we face? Deferred maintenance. Our, we, we serve a low income, we serve a homage with low income. You know, a roof is on uh, somewhat time, roofs are sometimes put down on the bottom unless there's food and medicine. Um, so vermiculite that, we find that in about a quarter of our homes and then we have to go through the abatement process, uh, get, to, get them linked up with the, the um, vermiculite trust fund. Yep. I mentioned before, they pay up, up to $4,100 to remove it, even though it's theirs and they knew it had asbestos and they still let <laughs> Bing Crosby was one of the original uh, spokesperson for vermiculite insulation. It's easy, you just pour it in and yeah. Um, and drink it. Yeah, we spend, on most of the, we bring in outside resources for about eight to $12,000 for a typical vermiculite abatement job before we even start our job. Um, leaking roofs is a big one, crumbling foundations, Moisture problems, both bulk and inhabitant cause. Uh, so those are mold problems. Knob and tube or unsafe wiring. Um, we do not touch a wall. You know, we, we uh, dense pack cellulose into the walls of homes. If it's not a tube in there, it's not a good thing. So we often have to either not do the measure or have somebody come in and do it. Um, we prefer to have, if we can bring in the resources, we prefer to have somebody do that. Uh, Non-functioning or unsafe heat and hot water, uh, another big challenge. And so this, so that deferred maintenance, so that's, you're recognizing this before you even start your, your circle graphic in terms of going in and a home being approved, yeah. you're, first, you're looking at all of these to say, can you even start? Well, the first one, that usually we hope that it's caught at the energy coach level, uh, that very first level okay. going there, it's not his job to take care of those things. But he right. looks at. He has to recognize. Yes, recognize it, and he doesn't get into the attic. So sometimes those problems are not found until a coach, or the uh, the auditor goes in. Okay. But we're looking to get those as early in the process as we can. We find that clients don't tell us that they have, yeah. or don't just don't know. They don't know what vermiculite is. They've been doing it for 20 years. It's just this stuff that they have to sweep up every now and then, or suck up with a <clears throat> in a shop vac. Um, so that's really where we pinpoint it. Those jobs tend to go into another track because it takes so long for the auditors to work through those processes, bringing those you know USDA 504 loans if they're eligible, Champlain Housing Trust if they're eligible, uh, you know Neighbor Works if they're eligible, stuff like that. Those resources. How many projects are would be sort of stopped in their tracks because of these issues? Is that 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 your aren't Maybe you can't get I think 25 to 30 last year where okay. we got through the program, but we have one whiteboard that has 20 vermiculite jobs on it. And then we're working through that process. Are you doing the hybrid approach anymore? Uh, a little bit, if there's, but those are very small. Um, sometimes if it's an attic that's not going to see any use, we'll leave it there and blow over it. It's not the preferred method by any means. We do not like to leave, but when you're talking, some of those, we got one house that the estimate was forty thousand dollars, and the energy bill was over. The energy bill for the year was over two thousand dollars. So what do you do? We chose to take the non-preferred method and blow. You put air a, seal first. Air seal, put a cap on it, and then we've actually worked with a couple of the abatement contracts to teach them how to air seal and uh, blow cellulose because we, as an agency, are. Uh, workers' comp insurance does not allow us to go into a uh, hazardous environment. So, so it's an insurance thing, not a not a state rule. State yeah, law. yeah, it's 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 that we you know we train two companies to be able to do it, and it's much safer for my employees because they're not used to working in those you know negative pressure areas. And so it just it's just a good partnership that we they work, and we try not to use that. Is workers comp a big part of your, your budget challenge? We're actually very, I'm very excited that we have one of the low, we have about, our workers comp right now is about 6.5% for the construction field. 
which anybody who's a contractor knows that 6.5 in the field is so low. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's been as high as 16. You have one, we have, if we have one serious injury, it goes back to 16 probably. But we're at 6.5 because we work safe and Wonderful. efficient. So, um, so it is a challenge, but at right now, it's a, it's a smaller challenge for me. Good. But we have monthly safety meetings and. We have a, our QCI is also our safety guy. Don't get on his bad side standing on top of a step ladder or not using a ramp on the back of the trucks. Um, so funding to take care of these issues, we get it. It's very slow. We can always use more. Um, other factors, I talked about before about a limited workforce. Weatherization is actually a very um, skill-based because, as I said before, we can kill people if we screw it up very easily. So it takes about a year for one of our people, a year of straight work to where we think that they are capable of doing the job on their own, all aspects of it. You take a green employee and you okay. train them for a year? Depending on the employee. I, I am more about the fit with the rest of the staff than the experience, but I know that I pay a price of some months, but I am about the fit with the rest of the organization. Knock on wood, I've been there two years and I've lost one employee out of 25. So, um, we have people that are, the three that are, have heard great things about on Friday, hopefully. <laughs> cool. Um, long waiting list, like I said, we were close to, and now we're, we're getting that shortened down. And really the lack of qualified contractors that want to work with us, because to be honest, our work sucks. It's hot, it's dirty, it's filthy, it's nasty. Our housing stock is not great that we work in. A lot of our folks are not great housekeepers. Uh, do other, you, do you ever try to sub to other contractors who are certified and operating in the state? We have, but it adds a level of expense. And um, I will say that we, are, we control, we're, we're able to control our crews very tightly. Mm -hmm. um, when we subcontract out, we do have challenges we've had challenges in the past with quality and having them work on our timeline and so yeah but if there's the one of the the governor's climate council one of the biggest things was to ramp up a certain amount of time for a certain amount of money um, we just we just we want that to be controlled and that's definitely gonna we're definitely gonna have to train subcontractors because we won't be able to do the work higher fast enough and train them. It, it appears that, that there's a shift ongoing with these contractors who have just realized there's not a whole lot of money in this and why aren't we looking for bigger jobs? I think the Energy Futures Group and others have been writing up on this. Is, this is a trend that's working against you. Well, the, 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 I'm going to say the higher middle income folks and the uh, upper income folks that are not sensitive to the the energy issues or not sensitive to the cost of fuel or any of those things do they just don't see the payback. You're talking about you know, we're talking about a 10, 15, 20 year payback on some of these items. But you're saving immediately and it's just hard to sell when the cost of fuels are so low. Um, yeah, I mean when natural gas is so low price, we find that with natural gas houses we don't do as many measures because they don't screen. They, the cost of the fuel is so low that we, they, the measures don't screen, so we can't do that, even though we know we should. Okay. Until it isn't. Right. But you are right, John. What we've seen is con a lot of contractors who aren't able to be profitable doing weatherization work and and going for it, then, then switching their focus to you know getting like gut rehab or large jobs a few a few years instead of trying to do 10, 15, Weatherization jobs at eighty five hundred to ten thousand a piece. It's it's a tough. I mean, plus the work sucks, right? Like it's hard. Before, no, not a lot of people want to do it. I say I tell my folks every day. I stand up every time I stand up in front of them. I said I thank you every day for what I do. I'm excited to come here because you guys are my heroes. I send you to hell every day, whether it's a hot hell or a cold hell. But I and I know that. And you know, they see me get up there in the attic, and I'm I'm larger than some. And I just start to sweat immediately. And I'm like, how do they do that? And Jan Demers, our executive director for CDOAO, we got her up in an attic, and she and it was 100 and 
40 degrees in the attic that day, and we, you know, we have rules to protect our workers. At that point, it's 10 minutes in, 10 minutes out. And she was, she was in tears coming out because she knew that folks had to work in those conditions. So they do, they do suck. And strongly called choices. Assuming there'd be more resources in the future, you're employing more personnel and increasing their wages. You've got longevity, but you also have an entry factor because they're probably making more money than they would on the farm. So is, is that a I will tell you that I pay seventeen fifty to start with full benefits, um, full medical, full dental, full everything, mm -hmm. and it's very good. And that's I pay more than most of the other agencies around because they don't have to pay that much around the rest of the state. But um, yeah, and and for one of our auditors, we talked about crews. And the crew chief is, you know, they got to have at least two years on, on the site. But our auditors, they have to have all the basic understanding of how to install the measures, plus they have to have all the rest of the building science that goes with it, because it is a true house as a system building science. You change one thing, you got to understand what else you're changing. So the house works. So the big picture is we're cost effective, and testing and analysis shows this. Uh, we're effective, allows Vermonters with low income to stay in their more efficient homes. We hear it time and time again. If it wasn't for you guys saving that $200 a month, I wouldn't be able to stay here. I'd be selling my home and moving out. Um, elderly allows them to age in place longer. Uh, it's com comprehensive, complete, and safe. We're all, we, like I say, we're holistic because of the efficiency coaching, behavioral change. But we also have a program called One Touch, where when the efficiency coach goes out, he's looking at all the other things in the house. Whether are there smokers in the house? Um, you know. All those other things, Vermont programs that those folks do not know about. Uh, you know, the, biggest, the one we refer most to is smoking cessation or uh, accessibility for elderly folks, grab, grab handles, getting them in with the right person and, and doing that. Um, you know, unfortunately, we do some uh, try to put them in touch with drug counseling or you know services for the children. It's all a one-step shot, and we can refer them. Sometimes the only ones in there. Um, helping enter Vermont to meet its energy goals for 2050. SIR ROI of one to one is the minimum. It seems you could add two more items to this. One, there are improved health impacts, particularly for children and elderly. Shouldn't that be a part of the big picture? It should, but they just barely, within the last year or so, or last, maybe the last five years, have really started looking at the health effects of the work that we are doing with the indoor air quality. Two of the biggest ones that we hit on are COPD and asthma. And they're actually doing studying those right now. And there's a lot of information out there that, yeah, what we're doing energy-wise is great, but what we're doing for asthma patients, folks who suffer from asthma, and there was a study down in Rutland that Naval Works and Brock mm -hmm. and Rutland mm -hmm. Hospital were doing is amazing. And the amount of lost days dramatically lower both school and work. The amount of emergency room visits is significantly lower. And so we're looking at another aspect of our program called the Healthy Homes Initiative, yeah. where we're going in and controlling the contributors. Um, are there dirty carpets? Are, you know, is there a lot of chemicals stored under the, under the X? Is there a lot of moisture issue? All of those things we're looking at, and it's really exciting that um, those aspects are gonna send the SIR, once they've monetized those, yeah. And that's just for asthma and COPD. Mm -hmm. Those are going to go through the roof. I mean, yeah. they are way better than energy benefits. And doesn't this benefit the state treasurer? It, uh, well, it reduces Vermont's burden to carry. Uh, um, it should. People in emergency room. Yes. And, yeah. and, and I think another is uh, it's going to add value to the home. It does. We, we hate it, but oftentimes, you know, somebody, there's elderly folks living in there, and they, they have a limited ownership of that house. And you'll see a real estate ad, newly weatherized in the last two years or something like that. And they use it as a selling feature. Sure, sure. It adds. I mean, you still put lean stuff on it? We do not put a lean on anymore. We used to put liens on homes, and they were uh, steadily decreasing liens for five years. That was five years time. self retiring. Yeah, five years self retiring. So we still get calls about once a month for the. Uh, Lawyers calling us up. Hey, you got a lien on this building? Well, no, we don't. That you know that went away five years ago. So and there are some interesting things happening with the healthy homes. Um, right now, there's some work up. In, I think it's in the Northeast, 
kingdom um, where healthcare professionals are identifying patients who have COPD or, or asthma and um, trying to see if there's an opportunity to fix their homes for free as a prescribed measure from the doctor. So if, if, yeah, if we can get to the point where we're monetizing the health benefit, then there's a whole funding stream to help double, triple, all this work. And Amworks is working with me. That should be some return on your program. If, if, if it's just to monetize what it's saving uh, hospital visits and whatever for the homes that are being serviced. Well, what we're looking for is that it may, it may make the HRV if we, if we, uh, show the savings and the health benefits and we can monetize that, then those HRVs and ERVs, that becomes accessible to more folks through our program, maybe. Um, but it's mostly about controlling the contaminants and making the indoor air quality better with ASHRAE and, and uh, the things that we do. So. Is there anything in the program, given sort of the changes with sort of smart technology and, and uh, internet enabled devices to control or to monitor the homes that you've done to be able to to see how they improve or or not over time. There has not been. There's been some studies that we're we're working with um, Ellen Tan, one of them. She's really the one that's behind the Healthy Homes um, to bring some of that to Vermont. Um, but we haven't mainly because of the more technologically advanced the device is, the less capable, I don't want to make this sound bad, but a lot of our clients won't use it, don't know how to use it, don't care to use it. They want to dial thermostat. They don't even want a programmable thermostat. We tried digital programmable thermostats for a while. It was a nightmare because yeah. they just wouldn't, couldn't, didn't have the bandwidth. To, yeah. their, their bandwidth is so crowded with just their daily living and how to survive yeah. that 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 digital yeah. blinking thing on the wall that suddenly they have no heat was a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. There's also some compatibility issues with some of the old oil boilers right. around that you just can't hook up some of these thermosets to them. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Sim simpler the better. Out of sight, out of mind. I spin the dial, I'm good. Or I turn the light on, I'm good. Yeah. Um, we put smart switches on a lot of bathroom fans to program to get them to the ASHRAE standards to ensure that they have the minimum allowable air changes, and those are a big issue. They're a huge issue. It's going to suck all, it runs all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't run all the time. It runs 20 minutes out of every hour to ensure that you have the good air that you want. Um, but it, it's just, it's, we edu try to educate, it doesn't always sink in. It's, it's costing me electricity, it costs me energy because you're pumping out my hot air. Also, with the hot air is going to moisture. Is there any uh, feedback or follow-up with the houses that you've done? Um, we do a survey that we send out to them at the end, asking them to send in, and then about every 10 years, OEO does a study, energy study. Um, we, we hear from a lot of our clients a lot after we're done, um, simply because we're the last one in the house, yeah. and any problem, we warranty our we warranty our work for a year, like most of it. But um, we are the last ones in their house, and maybe the only ones that have ever been in there. So we are a resource for them afterwards. We get that quite a bit. And we've changed our strategy over the last two years because there was a lot of when you say you can't come out because the issue is not yours, it turns into a negative relationship. Whereas even though you know, even though there's times when I know it's nothing that we caused, but we go out to the house. Some team of us goes out to the house and gives them an option and a way out of whatever it is that they're they're doing. And that's changed the way our relationship has gone hmm. immensely. The state does evaluations on you, though, from yeah. every what three, four. Every we're supposed to come every two years to do the monitor. They technically come and monitor. We just went through one, um, so they look at all of our work. Did we go by the tech manual? Did we do everything we were supposed to do? And. Uh, Luckily, I have another issue. Not but there are other questions related to this presentation. I can wait. But, uh, when we had our conversation, you talked about WEC and its Tier 3 approach. And I think Tier 3 is a really um, gem for finding more resources. 
Can you um, describe some of what you know about Tier 3 and what, what WEC is? Well, Washington Electric Company is okay. that one. It says by WEC. Yeah. There's Tier 1, 2, and 3, and the, the public, the utilities are supposed to hit those goals and their energy efficiency goals. And the first two primarily deal with um, energy demand side energy reduction and uh, renewable buying more from renewables. Mm -hmm. Tier 3 is a little odd in that it gets into that the, the utilities to, to hit their goals are allowed to buy, um, they can convert thermal savings into energy savings. Mm -hmm. So like Washington Electric, the, their MMBTU savings, millions of uh, MMBTU versus thermal units savings, and they can convert that into the equivalent uh, electrical. Uh, megawatt, and hours. megawatt hours, and then they're going to buy. So they basically buy that work from. Uh, you know, in that case, it's Capstone who's doing that. Who's that area? They're going to buy those um, units from them, so that then Capstone will be able to do more. Um, and Capstone might be putting in heat pumps, etc., that would increase the demand for electricity for WEC, which is a return on. We already do that anyway. If it's if if, if, if it's an oil furnace or something, it makes sense to put in a. Uh, they're a high user, and it makes sense to put in a, um, a heat pump. EVT is doing that, so that uh, it's, EVT covers all utilities, electric utilities, except for BED. Relative Electric is on their own, mm -hmm. so EVT covers all those other measures. But when it comes to tier three and MMBTU savings, so Efficiency Vermont has their program and services. And some utilities, so all the utilities have to meet this requirement. So some of them are buying some or all of the savings that are either from a WAP program or from the Efficiency Vermont program um, that would uh, theoretically, anyway, free up some money for those other entities to go do more work. Oh. There's a lot of work being done on trying to expand Tier 3, and I've had a, a long conversation with Richard Fazy at the uh, Energy Futures Group. He's in fact finishing a paper for uh, High Meadows Foundation that will really provide some ideas on how to expand Tier 3. And uh, I think it's left to our imagination to, and possibly the legislature, to uh, tweak that. We see it as a very similar relationship between W, slightly different, but between WEC and Capstone and us and, and, B, and BED and Vermont Gas, um, allowing them to buy savings that we generate and give, give, give them credit, and then we get more uh, capital to do more jobs. Or, so. It's really the, util you know, the utilities have to see the benefit to do it, and if they don't, like if, if GMP has a better way to meet their requirements, then they're not going to pay a lot of money. To if they can do, if they can meet all their requirements, of getting all of theirs through renewable energy and, and save and demand side savings. There's no reason for them to spend that extra money. I see. Right. So it's a, and there's a lot of it's a slippery pole. What's that? It's a slippery pole. And, it, and it's and it's just one. I think it's just tier three is just one pool or pot of work that we need to go after to make it do more work faster. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm a, I was a, when I was sitting at the, the climate, Governor's Climate Action Committee, I was like, we need to make this sustainable and, and ramp up so that we have the, the, the workers are all skilled and have the abilities. But you also have the fact that our, our contractor pool, heating contractors, electrical contractors, roofing contractors, they're diminishing. There's just not that many people going in, and we, we have a hard time finding A, more contractors, but also B, ones that want to work on the housing stock that we're working in. Because it's not easy. So There's a lot of new build happening that they'd much rather do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. New, yeah, new, new building. <coughs> Electricians love, the plumbers love new construction. Yeah. And they hate what we're doing. And who wants to go work on a mobile? I mean, it's not. Climate an attic that's 200 years old. Yeah, where there's rat droppings and bat. We just, had one of, <laughs> we just went on our technical monitor and the homeowner didn't want us in the attics because she has a significant bat population living in there. I've been there. So, yeah. 
Well, is, it, is that helping with the insulation then? <laughs> yeah, no, may, I would think it probably helps a lot with air sealing. Because <laughs> if you're ever trying to shovel that stuff out, after it's been sitting there for a couple of years, it's yeah. not on the concrete yeah. though. So it must be uh, at some point it makes more sense to build new. And when do you decide when it's? It makes more sense to just create a really efficient home instead of try to prop up with them. Well, we were very excited to see the Vermont come through, but the Vermont unfortunately is at a price point that we have a hard time getting our clients into, mm -hmm. especially the mobile home plants. The worst housing units that we see are the most closest to unlivable, I'll call them, are mobile homes because you're basically in a tin can. Uh, so and there's a lot of those that are, have mold issues, have indoor air quality issues, have rot problems. Um, that's where we'd like to see those folks go. But we just did a, we call it self, we did a self grant, Safe Efficient Living Futures Grant, where we were trying to bring those 504 CHT funds energy smart or energy saver loans from credit union and opportunities credit. We were trying to bring those to the lower income clients. And what we found was is that the lower income clients are A, afraid of debt, B, they, they too much bandwidth, they, they're in that survival mode, yeah. and, it, and it didn't work. And we found that they were not, not ready to do They weren't ready to jump to it. And where the long answer to the short question was that, so those homes, we have some funding to help them buy down those loans. I mean, but it, but there was still a responsibility there that we had to put on the homeowner to pay that loan, yeah. and they just weren't ready to do it. Yeah. I, I would buy a Vermont for my son and my kids any day if we want to be something. Like if I could I want to suggest that to their first house, love those things. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Right. Awesome. What's the price point now? I think for the mobile home version, it's like sixty to 70000 For the A-Fame version, it's like one to 110. But it's zero energy. Yeah, and they're it, amazing. And, and you drive six or eight pylons into the ground, put the house on there, peg it in, you're done. So what starts running? Yeah, it's all beautiful, efficient. And it, this is modular, so much of it is built in a factory. And all built in a factory. They put it on a truck, like the chalet version that they have at North Avenue Co-op. Have you seen that one? It's a chalet style, single bedroom, living room, bathroom, HRV run, indoor air quality all. They, they brought it in on that. The, the, the actual top part of the solar was on another trailer, pulled it in, set it, put the roof on, attached it, hooked it to the grid, done. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was two days, Maybe. including driving the pilots. Wow. I saw a bunch of these different ones at the um, Tiny House Festival in yeah. Rattleboro. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. But they have one that they designed specifically to look like a mobile home yeah. and feel like a mobile home for yeah. that crowd, but it just didn't. There's that debt issue right there that you yeah. can't. You can't wish away all the debt, and they have to take some of it. it just yeah. they're yeah. Some, I mean, some people are doing it. There's, yeah. there's I think, eighty something of yeah. those out there now in, in Vermont, which you know, it's pretty good to replace the mobile home. Eight foot mobile homes with, with one of those. Yeah. And again, you really have to be tuned into the the energy safe energy world the to understand the whole. I mean, yeah. like, I didn't need solar. It cost me more money. But I knew what I was doing was the right thing. That's why I went with solar. Um, plus, the feel good feeling like in 10 years I'll have free power. But, yeah. um, but that, you got to be attuned to that. And again, I go back to the band with the survival mode. Yeah. And they just don't have it, yeah. the majority. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for coming yeah, really out. Good work. Really. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, awesome. And I put out, yeah. Um, yeah. Great question. When we do the Bristol project, I'll try to let John know when we're going to be there. It should be this fall, and folks can come out and kind of yeah. see That's where great. we're going. And That'd be great. Yeah. And same. Uh, yeah, I invite you. you to come anytime to come out and check us out and see what we're doing. Where are you going to be? Well, we'll we're all over. I'm just oh, okay. anytime. Anytime. Yeah. Okay. Great. Open door. Thank you for your time here. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a wish list that would help your work? Wish list? Um, I thought, it, well, I, hate, I really hate to say more money yeah. without yeah. the other parts that go with it. <clears throat> the train portion, mm -hmm. the, True. And, and making it, making it, it needs to be an economy, we need to grow an economy mm -hmm. in that sector so that 
uh, people see that there's a future for the green green collar jobs, like we call them. Yeah. That there's a there's a future for that, and that they they go through this you know two years of training, and suddenly the program goes away for whatever reasons. There has to be something for them to fall back on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we just haven't done a done an okay job. We haven't done a great job of building that economy. Yeah. Have you ever considered uh, the career centers around the state? Yeah, many of them. Same thing. Yeah, many of them have have uh, uh, building trades uh, operations. I was surprised at how few there were. Yeah, because yeah. when I first got on, yeah. when I first got on, my like, first time as director, we were four four installers short. So my first thing was I'll bring on some young folks that are coming out of the trades. Mm. The nearest one is in Rutland, to me, and they're all getting soaked up, you know, rocks grabbing everyone that they can. So, and there's, there isn't one in Chittenden County. Have you looked at um, Hannaford Career Center? Uh, I don't think they do not have one. I call used it. to, yeah. I used to, we used to have a building history yeah. program and it was well subscribed. And then 2008 came along. And there was and, so cute. And, uh, the interest in the program dropped off significantly, and I don't know that there's been an effort to revive that. That's I was on the board. They still have a facility, but and it might uh, be interesting to talk to them. There needs to be there. There's a whole lot of work that needs to be done. The <coughs> that we have in career centers, they're terribly underutilized. Wow. There's little to no communication between industry. Uh, uh, whomever would be the point person to say there are jobs in this area, these are the skills we need people to, to embark on. Um, and what most of the career centers are interested in is making sure that they can attract students and so they often have the programs that do that. Some of which are very appropriate, um, you know, that, that could lead to good paying jobs, culinary would be one example. Um, there's some tech oriented things. But in other areas, not necessarily uh, a place that's going to help lead someone to a, to a brighter career. From a technical college, I know uh, uh, Ms. Moulton is trying very hard to invigorate that institution. It's hard to, to make changes. And the career centers have been, uh, I think, uh, neglected in terms of the potential that they have especially today when young people, you know, it's not like your uncle's going to get you a job at the GE plant, right? Like days of old. Yeah. And you have to have a mindset with flexibility and learning some basic problem solving or whatever so you can give yourself some opportunities for the future. My dad worked for the same company for over 40 years. How often does that happen? Yeah. Right. You know, um, People like Middlebury College are going to be laying people off. Yeah. You've got to have a, a, a different way of looking at things. Yeah. Well, the, the, other, we don't. the other connection might be through just high school guidance offices um, because there are, I know in my experience, there are a lot of uh, kids who may not have gotten a career center but either have family in the trades, you know, they've worked summers, they have interests, they want to go that way. and. Uh, and I think guidance counselors often have a pretty clear picture who might be great candidates to do like a summer internship, uh, which would in turn maybe excite them about doing that kind of work. We are working with, we work with Tom Longstro's group, uh, uh, the resource, youth build. youth build resources, and we actually hired, we've hired several from our, we have three great women that work for us. And they've had some of them promoted into other jobs, but they started through women. Women, uh, women can work. No. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Works for women, and uh, yeah. they go down every year to that group, and the kids love it. But then they come and interview, and we show them what we're doing, and it's hot, dirty work, and no mm -hmm. kids don't want. I, mean, yeah. I have kids that are baristas at Starbucks, and they're making eleven bucks an hour. I'd love to have that kid, and I say, I'd like to have a job that pays seventeen fifty an hour to start full benefits. Ah, oh, what does it do? And I tell her, and they're like, "No, I'm going to make coffee." Yeah. <laughs> it's six dollars and fifty cents yeah. different. Yeah. But they don't want to do. Sure, yeah. Yeah. there's plenty of yeah, there's plenty of examples of that. 
yep. yeah. in larger farms, how many people, immigrants or, or illegal immigrants work there. And it's because their young people don't want to do that, right? Yeah. Which is terribly unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, you should hear the great one I get from my 18 year old that's making minimum wage at Lowe's right now, loading stuff in people's car. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's an interesting idea for the energy committee to take on would be some volunteer groups, you know, find some homes that you might do some sort of low-level weatherization on, rim joist, weather stripping, right. get a group of volunteers together, encourage kids, maybe through guidance counselor or kids and parents or something like that. Just try to build that next generation. It's, it is crappy work and if if we can't get to a point where it's even 20 bucks an hour with full benefits, then people aren't going to choose it. Yeah. Even if you had it at Hanford, you know, they don't see that as their, their end goal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but plus, you get them mission-driven first. Yeah. Before well, they, they know what calling through for me, you know. Yeah. I, I, had the don't idea of, I had the I idea of saving energy before I did all that. So. Yeah. Well, people who are not a part of the industry, but get involved with housing construction, I'm thinking of Habitat for Humanities. It's possible that some of those volunteers might say, uh, you know, I, I've been there, I've done that, I'm ready to step up. And, and you know, calling some of them up might be a... a uh, but there's a hundred total in the Weatherization Assistance Program on the five agencies. There's a hundred total, total, hundred total employees, give or take. You know. Um, for our the five agencies that we run, mm -hmm. that's a hundred jobs. There has to be, in order to bring folks into this industry and want to do it, there has to be, A, there has to, you've, you've got to have more people at the higher income levels that want to uh, do this to their home and pay for it. And there are 70 plus contractors out there that have been doing, that are doing the work and they're having trouble hiring people too, so mm -hmm. come up with them. Yeah. So start a training regimen. Um, you got to make it. You got to make it. They've got to have an economy out there to grow those employees. Because how many people want to go to school for a job where there's a hundred total in the state of Vermont? And some of those guys are making really big money. Oh, I know they are. <laughs> I pay them to keep them there. <laughs> no. Some of those contractors are making. Yeah, the contractors really make big money. But they're work. You know, they're working for you know NeighborWorks or. CHT and some of those agencies. Well, there's guys out there that are working yeah. on their own. I, well, I, I'm yeah. just coming from that. I'm working yeah. on yeah. their own. Sense. You're doing the home performance of energy star type of jobs. Let's let mm -hmm. Yeah. No, but I only did like one or two of those a year. Well, yeah, no, but the, the contractors that are making good money. I mean, there, there are people who are of the mind to fix their homes, whether it's a 30 or 40 year payback, and they have the money to do it, and they're going to pay right. 20 to $30,000, and they're willing to do that. There's not a lot of them, not enough of them. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but they're there. But those companies are, some of them are doing very well. I did the energy efficiency Vermont home thing years ago, not that long ago, five, six years ago. Um, local private contractor was through your organization. Uh, and uh, I had fortunately over the years had done a lot on my own. But he found weaknesses, especially around the foundation and the basement of the home, which he said is a big area. And I never really thought about it in terms of energy efficiency. And uh, I didn't have to spend a lot of money. It was maybe four grand. And we got that money back in four years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. It was bang. Yeah. It, it was huge. And, and I have an old home. And the comfort level, That's the drafts ended. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was so much more comfortable yeah. than, than it ever was before. And, uh, and you're right, there are a lot of affluent people, or more affluent people, that because of their resources, it's not up front and center. And somehow there has to be, I think, an education done mm -hmm. uh, a little bit there, yeah. because it's a, it is a win-win in, in many different ways. The free, and, uh, the free walkthroughs are, are a help. Well, we've, we've, been doing, we've been doing that at our and church. I, I, I was thinking. Organizations like this, which every town is supposed to have, I believe, um, you guys can be a wonderful vehicle for doing that education and reaching out to people in whatever ways you, your imagination can conjure up.
Yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's local, it's grassroots, yeah. people you know, um, yeah. and uh, and I think it would be a wonderful way to approach the approach the, uh, the situation. Yeah, I, I like the idea of the walkthroughs, and also when you were talking about volunteers, <coughs> getting are, are you talking about getting any community people, kids, or I mean young people and community people who care about this, mm -hmm. and then. I mean, they, we have to get some people who know what they're doing, so get a few, peop few people who really can train the other volunteers. Yeah, and I'm sure, I mean, I'd be willing to train. I'm sure if it's yep. in Vermont, we'd come down yeah. and, yeah. and okay. help with that, too. Yeah. Um, so I think we can find people to educate the, the crews if there's... Okay. Find the crew. If you can find the crew and, okay. and right. find a willing owner. Right. So one of the things we do in the Underhouse Committee, and I'm in charge of the education program, is that in the winter months, once a month, and we're working with EDT and some other folks because, you know, EDT has some great instructors. Um, Laurent Blake on Dave Dave Keefe yeah. um, came in and uh, did a presentation. But monthly courses on, you know, and they're they're based on just uh, whatever they happen. Building science, basic building science, how to you know do a sill insulation as a as a as a weekend. Um, come in and we'll teach you. Or that's what we're doing. So once a month during the winter, you're not getting it anybody in the summer. But once a month during the winter time, offer a course, and that's what we're doing. Are people coming to them? Uh, we started. I started joined late last year. I started. I did two, and I got twelve at one and ten at the other. That's not bad. That's good. So that's that's a start. Yeah. And uh, double yeah. digits. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. And yeah, that's right. One uh, successful project can make for two more. Mm -hmm. They're coming sure. about each other. Yeah. Gets, Everybody who volunteers might see that and be like, now, they, now they're armed with the knowledge, they go back to their house. And yeah, and look at what they need. Yeah. 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 It would be neat to get them people to go, okay, let's go to your house next time and do it and bring some more people on. Right. And so it just sort of chains. Well, we're, looking at, we're looking at um, buttoning up Vermont. Right. Um, now, efficiency Vermont's so. been researching this stuff for a long time. <clears throat> I seem to recall this same conversation happening like again and again. Yeah, it's going to have to. It's like, not rocket really? science. It's just about it's getting it. people motivated. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like if you're driving down the well, street. Well, which see. of these things are actually kind of working? Like, the, I really like the idea of the, the energy walkthroughs where somebody went before an auditor or anything and just kind of filled out the. What the market? And, you know, what the market suggests is that. People aren't ready to go in big, but if they were to do a small project and see the results, they will come back and do more. Yeah, uh, and that's where the volunteerism or some some community group doing a pretty small project, like just the perimeter of the basement, and people feel that and and understand how it impacts their comfort and their bills. Then they're like, "What else can I do? This really this really works. Okay, I'll go." Find out what's next. So, I mean, so that's a good good way to move forward. Get them addicted. That, it's, yeah. it's a bad term, but you know. No, sure. Sure. Give sure. them a list that they prioritize. They can prioritize with mm -hmm. somebody that knows and work off that list is a great way of. Mm. So how do you get that list? How do you get them to get that's that? That's the list? free walkthroughs or something. That's yeah. a walkthrough. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey Matt, does does efficiency Vermont work with schools in any fashion? Um, the thought is, uh, and again, my experience is with Mount Abraham, that they do have um, a wood shop. You know, kids are interested in building things and working with their hands. <clears throat> Work going in and actually doing a workshop with the kids and leaving them with, okay, let's see if you can go home and how many deficiencies might you find in your house. Yeah, go into your basement. You know, yeah. look at those uh, the sills and mm -hmm. and uh, is yeah. there anything there? There is a program called VEEP. It's uh, Vermont mm -hmm. Energy Education Program. I think is what it is. And so that has um, curriculum that teachers can call and sign up for, and yeah. then a staff will go to that school and into the classroom, whatever works for the teacher, and and do a session on. There's a few different ones. You know, solar is one and. Uh, weatherization is on. Sure, and it could be, a, well, you mentioned solar incorporated into a science class. Right. There's a lot of math involved, too. You can do math. And um, 
I don't think there is anything though that's hands on. Like, let's put a mock up of a basement sill here. And yeah. This is how you do it. It's more build a model, talk about it in theory. Right. But do you want a high schooler going home and sealing up the basement <laughs> <laughs> without knowing what the heating system is? No, but there, that's there's what I thought. <laughs> I, I urge some level of caution mm -hmm. in yeah, the volunteer yeah. and walk through in the labor because, as I said, it does it seem like it make a big deal? But with, when you change, especially in the basement, because that's where most of the combustion appliance zones are. Yeah. yeah. Just make sure you get the proper training because yeah. when you start doing the sills, you can change that dynamic and then then you change the way the house works. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, my thought with the kids was just to go home and have a dialogue with the parents. Yeah, that starts. Yeah, yeah. they, they, so see, they that, see things in their yeah. house and they notice that they're, oh, maybe this could be better. Mm -hmm. And say, hey, dad. And, and if their parents understand also that BEC could help walk them through the A to the Z of it. You know, we, we will keep answering your questions, we'll just keep encouraging you to take the next step. And that's something that BEC could be doing. Just we need to get our training, yeah, and we need to get our training from, uh, who was it, Paul Markowitz who was there last time? Well, I think, isn't Paul going to be down in uh, Middlebury on Friday? Didn't we get that? Yeah, yeah. there was something about going to his Paul on Friday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's going to be, uh, at uh, three squares of Virginia, yeah. so if you want to join us, EBT has plenty of resources. We yeah. have a you consider us a resource. Yeah, we're working it through. Uh, what do you hope to get out of coming around to? Get your ride with you. I, 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 we are one of the best kept secrets in the Vermont the museums, so and I'm gonna shoot we, up there. you know you talk about in advertising, you yeah. advertise yeah. while you're busy. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know we got 146 jobs, not quite a year's worth of work that's eligible now. I just want to come out here and tell you that our program exists. Yeah. Um, and make us, you know, have be a resource, and um, know we're there for your. If you come across some low in, in your work, your travels, yeah. yeah. Please, if they have them, they're not on our list. Yeah. Give them an application and have them call Deborah if they if you need help filling the application out. You know, we'll Deborah will fill it out with them. Is the application available online? It is. So you and we're changing there and print it out? Yep, cboao.org, and then you go to the weatherization tab, and the application's right there. Um, it's a little bit daunting. It can be. It's seven pages, I think. But can people print it, fill it out? They can print it and fill okay. it out. For those that are computer savvy right now, one of my what we're trying to do is create a fillable document that they can email to us. We're also trying to get DocuSign going so that we don't get stuff lost in the mail. Um, we learned that from UBT. They, their uh, um, targeted high use program as well as their uh, um, the low income that we we implement for them. Uh, we've gotten to DocuSign a little bit too, and we're hoping to make things more efficient and quicker. And okay. so, so once you're on the list, do you stay on it? So your name comes up, or do. do you have to reapply ever? Nope. Once you're on the list, you're on the list. Um, you are subject to the WAP priority ranking um, as to when you're going to see somebody. Uh, I will say that folks that are in the 60 to 80 percent until we get our list under control, and it's come a long way. 60 to 80 percent of their median income is probably not going to see us. Um, so they could be on the waiting list for five, ten years. Not, they could be. But I, I promise that I'm going to be down to a six-month waiting list sometime in the next year, and they will, we will be starting to do the 60 to 80 percent, folks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you yeah, for coming. Thank you so much. Try to use up so much of your time. Oh, it's important. So I left some business cards here. You've got an application. Right. Find mm -hmm. a website. Please use me as a resource. Okay. Uh, any questions at all on that for you? Great. Or my staff. Thank you. Thank you. Dwight. Delegate. Huh? Delegate. Oh, yeah. That's me. Lieutenant <laughs> Colonels like to delegate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Thank you. Thank you. Are you related to a doctor? That's no. Okay.
uh, yeah, if you talk to any of the other energy committees around you, and have them give me a call. I'll okay. Down to the same thing. Okay. Great. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. prepared to listen. However, um, I do have some information, I guess, to share um, concerning weatherization, most specifically. Um, in the beginning of the last session, um, people like Paul Costello, conversations with John, um, speaking with Neil Lunderville, who was on the governor's uh, council for energy efficiencies or whatever. Um, and the idea of weatherization was one of the big pieces that came out of the work that that, that, that group did. And they were recommending a $100 million loan in order to really accelerate weatherization of Vermont homes, specifically those more affordable homes. And there, there, was a, there were goals and dates set to that, and it, it's clear that we, we weren't going to meet that. Um, and uh, people, uh, for various reasons uh, that I didn't necessarily get into, oh good, came to me and asked if I wouldn't get involved, and I did. And often when I get involved, I do with both feet. And um, the results, I, rather than giving you the whole backstory about why this didn't, this push didn't work or that didn't, effort didn't work, was that. Um, I was able to, with my friend uh, Beth Pierce, help our treasurer, mm -hmm. when I get along with very well. Um, she was willing to use $5 million from, um, not really a slush fund, but it's a fund of monies that sometimes when the state uh, borrows money to do things, sometimes people don't need it, but they don't need as much, et cetera, et cetera. And she had enough to dedicate to weatherization $5 million um, for, for uh, workforce slash affordable housing. Um, a separate bill was written up. Uh, it went through various committees. It ended up being part of the budget. I brought, a, I brought three copies of it if anyone wants to see literally the language in the bill. But what, what's interesting, just this week I met with Beth as she had ask once the budget all gets settled and we know we have the money, um, let's get together and talk about how we might do this. And uh, she had people in her staff develop a draft, which I, I made six copies of, which is actually what people will go through in order to apply for the $5 million. And, uh, and part of the work, which I think might be important for you to know, the applicants could be CVOEO, uh, could be the Heat Squad, Ludi's mm -hmm. outfit down in West Rutland and others, but it also can be municipalities. Mm -hmm. Municipalities working perhaps in conjunction with, with other partners. Uh, it's important to note that um, the really only appropriation, it's not really an appropriation that we have that, that CVOEO is using 2.1 million of, this uh, surcharge on heating fuel amounts to about 11 million bucks. And, that, and those are grants, those are dollars that are given. And there are specific limits, and I think it is 80%, that's usually the definition of affordable. Um, and those monies weren't around. Um, so what the treasurer is doing is providing $5 million, but she wants to get paid back. And she wants to get paid back over a, a little short a period of time as possible, but she's saying even as much as five or seven years. And so this is a loan program, which has been used successfully. The Heat Squad does an awful lot of that, working with low-income people and staying on people's cases so that things can work out. And, and virtually the, the loans are <coughs> negligible in terms of costs and things I think are developed so that people can know that they're going to get paid back given the efficiencies that they have gained in their own homes. 
I mean, it's a two-year program, so the five million wants to be spent. Some of the things in my research jive very much with what Dwight said in terms of the issues. There is a shortage of capacity. Um, if we, if if I had managed some way or another to get twenty million dollars to use in a, a year or two, chances are there might have been fourteen million dollars laying on the table at the end of that period of time because we don't necessarily have the people trained and whatever and up and ready to do it. Um, but I think, I think there's a hope that this is the beginning and it's, uh, and there's real optimism. CVOEO has expressed an interest. I know the Heat Squad has expressed an interest. Efficiency Vermont uh, would be willing to partner with people, but they don't necessarily and aren't willing, interestingly enough, to uh, guarantee the, the money that they get from the program. Because the treasurer will give the town of Bristol a quarter of a million dollars if your application is accepted. And as long as we guarantee to pay the treasurer back, the state of Vermont back in five years or something like yeah. that, they're cool with that. Yeah. Um, and uh, s some organizations seem to be a little more enthusiastic about that than others for whatever the reason. Um, here in Bristol, um, we also have the Revolving Loan Fund, which I've been very active in for years and years. And to my way of thinking, that's something that could be explored because totally. there's often money available there and perhaps enough that it could give your organization a little bit of a cushion in terms of offering up a guarantee. Um, that would have to be approved by the select board ultimately and go through the Revolving Loan Committee. Just a thought, yeah. just an idea. Yeah. And, and you all, perhaps, could be the generators of that education and enthusiasm. The other thing with the program that we did with the treasurer is that the income level is 120% of median. So we're looking at involving not just those people that we might consider a little disadvantaged economically, but others who would tell you they're a little bit disadvantaged economically too. It's not like you make 70 grand a year and you got a kid or two, uh, you know, there's a lot of extra ka um, rolling around. And we recognize that sometimes we don't recognize that group just above those 80% of median levels that often struggle um, and struggle mightily. And so including them is, or not making them eligible, I guess, yes. in the best word, we thought was a prudent thing to do with these $5 million. We also included in the program the ability for infrastructure things, which was another one of the, uh, you know, Dwight pointed out as a problem sometimes where you need to do some framing or you need to do some other work to make the insulation piece, the weatherization piece work, that would qualify. Um, and it would probably be the organization that's taken this on uh, to, to maybe set the, what specific guidelines one wanted to do there and what would and what wouldn't. The place might need a new roof, which would help with the, with the attic insulation. However, do you want to provide almost more money to do the new roof than the attic insulation would cost? Mm -hmm. Those would have to be decisions that, that, would, that would one would want to make and think about. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's a loan program, maybe you would. Knowing, no, you know, with a one percent loan or yeah. whatever it might be, that that you will get the resources yeah. back. And I know the treasurer's office. There's, there's other there's other folks that can be spoken to about this. Um, they've been down this road, most specifically with the Heat Squad and NeighborWorks um, organization that Dwight mentioned several times um, with loan programs. And the Heat Squad has had one default with many, many millions of dollars that they've gotten from the treasurer and worked with on this basis. So there's a way to do it with people up to 80% of median income. Um, so I was excited about it. I, I began even last year to cajole the administration um, because I know increasing the resources, because I know there are people, I think that was also said, they want to do a loan. That's problematic for maybe just fiscal reasons and maybe psychological reasons. And so I think more dollars that can be given on a grant basis is important in order to reach the objective. 
with the whatever it is, another 19 million household, 19,000 households or whatever that are underserved in this area. Forget the exact number. And um, I think I got their attention. They were shocked that I got the $5 million. They really were. They said, holy <laughs> shit. You know? And I think it opened their eyes. And I'm saying, you guys are crazy. You're, you're taking a lot of criticism for not stepping up to the plate um, in terms of meeting, meet, meeting our carbon emission goals. And it's not because they don't believe it or they don't care. I don't know that they've put the energy into that. And to me, weatherization is, is a win in so many different ways in terms of affordability for people, comfort for people, health reasons, property value potentially, mm -hmm. especially if it's a stick-built type home, right. um, and, and the reduction of carbon dioxide. Um, it, it's a plus for Vermont families that you mm -hmm. can see. Um, and you don't have the controversy, do you put 20 wind turbines on the top of South Mountain or something like that? Why aren't you guys all over this? And, and I'm hoping that my argument and persistency might add to the appropriations. That's my goal. Yeah. I wanted to say also it keeps money in the state rather than Absolutely. if you're adding fuel, there's, 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 you're sending it out of the state. There's so many good things about right. it. Right. And so it's <clears throat> not something that having done a good thing here, I'm going to let go. I'm going to try to, if the people have me back, I should say, um, I will try to continue to to work in this, because I think it's a really good thing. Yeah. Just like affordable housing has been one of the things that has been always on the top of my list, and it was even touched upon issues relative for opportunities for people in lower income with, with mobile homes that are 40 years old that they really shouldn't be living in, what opportunities are there, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we struggle with that. We struggle constructing things that are affordable for people. Um, and, uh, and you know, there's a $37 million bond, dollar bond that, that I helped with that hopefully will make a difference, but, but it's still only going to be a, you know, a big dot, but never necessarily a dot, and a, and a serious problem when it comes to at least reasonably quality housing for, for, for Vermonters, especially those that are in the lower income level, because building stick built homes are even less in a way that people can afford is very, very challenging. But that is the last thing I guess I'll mention, and I'll shut up about this, is that the program also recognizes working on units that are um, not owner-occupied, mm -hmm. but on apartment units. Mm -hmm. uh, the income qualifications go to that 80% again, at level, the lower level. And I think that's also an area that hasn't been maybe served as well in the weatherization um, arena where someone has an older home with four apartments or five apartments and it hasn't been with us. And I think it's, you know, we need, it would be great to focus on a little bit of that too, especially if the tenants are paying the energy bill. And I know sometimes they do. I was speaking with, with a young lady who lives across the street from me who rents from another young lady that I know pretty well. And she's having the heat squad do an energy audit. And a lot of it because her tenant says, if I can't keep, afford to continue to live here, the energy bill's too high. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the owner's doing something about it, which is, I think, a good <coughs> um, In any case, I brought the draft, it's six copies, of what one can expect in terms of the general rules and what the parameters the treasurer's office is looking for in terms of applications, which they're encouraging from all different folks, including municipalities. Yeah. Um, it's a two-year program, five million bucks. And um, I encourage you all, you can, you can make additional comments. I've got six Thank you. Um, I scribbled on one of them, so forgive me. I thought it was, I thought it was my, I thought, no, you can have it. It was my, it was my original, <laughs> which, I, which I have here. Um, and there's a young lady who uh, one can contact you want. It's a national one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think they can make comments. No, these oh, are all good. the same, right? Yes, yes they're all the same. <laughs> um, um, I read it. They're, they wanted my input. I, I, the only thing I can see, at least I'm going to read it a few more times, 
in that second paragraph where they talk about improvements, I think they could add a couple of things that were mentioned here today that weren't on that list of advantages mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that you guys cited. Um, I know this isn't going to be kicked off in a week or two. It's going to be a little bit of time yet, and it certainly would give uh, you know your group time to consult and talk about it and uh, partner with other energy committees in the in in the lo in the region. I don't know whether yeah. there's other in other towns whether mm -hmm. they have strong organiz yeah. a strong group like you might be. But but you know th those would be the things I guess I would think about. Uh, and to see if you want to leave it up to the CVOEOs, you want to partner with them in some way because you want to want to do something special, yeah. or whether it's something that you might want to do with with a, a Lincoln or a Moncton or a New Haven, etc. Yeah. Um, I think the world your oyster in terms of how you might want to approach this and how much you want to put yourselves into it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But. Uh, I'm enthusiastic, uh, and I know the treasurer is enthusiastic because she feels this is a, a really important area, and uh, God bless her for that. Can God I bless you for doing what you did. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Can I just ask a clarifying thing? Sure. Were you saying one of the things that could be done with this is create a revolving loan fund? Or were you saying just see, but using the one that's already in place to help? Well. The treasurer is going to loan the 3714 organizations. I know she's very concerned about geography. Yeah. Um, and she mentioned that in some of the credits that she's given in other areas where Washington County, Chittenden County um, are getting are getting 70 percent of it and yes. you know there's nothing in Orleans or Essex there's yes. nothing in Franklin there's three percent in Addison and so she's concerned with the weatherization program that there might be coverage throughout the state yeah. and Addison County is we don't we're not we're not lumped in with Chittenden even though there's a strong influence here mm -hmm. and I think that would be a favorable yeah. favorable thing and uh, whether you talk with a CVOEO whose territory is here, uh, but so isn't the Heat Squad, which is doing things statewide mm -hmm. and works with people on loans. I don't know how much CVOEO does with that. Uh, those are things I don't, I don't know all the details on that. Yeah. And it would take some energy on your part. Yeah. And whether you took the money, whatever it was you felt comfortable with, um, you want to repay it. So obviously you'll be loaning money to people, yeah. and part of the application would be your thinking and plans in that regard. Oh, okay. How you would do it, how much you might return. Yeah. You know. So right, it's not a revolving loan fund. It's just a, it's a one time. Well, from the treasurer's standpoint, it is, yeah. and there's nothing oh, right. to say that after two years she couldn't say, "This is great. Right. I'm going to do it again." It. Okay, great. Um, yeah. You know, there's some precedent with smaller amounts of money that she's done in the past yeah. um, because she recognizes that it's a win-win, as you mm -hmm. just said, for mm -hmm. Vermont and yeah. Vermonters. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's the cl closest thing I can think of a no-brainer in terms of all the pluses. Um, is, it, is it zero percent or is it depending That's going to be up to you. Yeah. And, and it was one of the questions I didn't ask because I didn't have a chance to read through this. I'm sure the treasurer would love to get back five million six hundred and ninety-five thousand rather than five. Um, but again, the audience that we're dealing with, and we want things to happen, mm -hmm. is that practical? Um, is that is that going to work? Now I'm going to guess she's going to want to give out multiple awards with geography in mind, mm -hmm. and I suspect different programs are going to look at it in different ways. Your organization was interested, but they didn't think they wanted to apply. Uh, and she and she was blunt in telling me that, unlike a few other organizations that are willing to guarantee the you know half a million dollars that they get, that 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 efficiency Vermont didn't want to do that. They they were willing to do something short of that. And she says, I know other, I know other organizations because of their confidence in dealing with things in this regard, they'd be willing to guarantee. Whatever we, whatever we gave them, um, they would be willing to pay back, regardless of how the program worked out. 
Um, but she said, I know they're very interested in maybe partnering and helping um, various applicants in this regard because of the expertise you have. And I don't know how many organizations throughout the state, nonprofits in particular, uh, have these weatherization programs. I just don't know. Um, the Neighbor Works is one of many, I think, four or five other agencies of its type around the state, and they're the only ones that do weatherization, as I understand it, because mm -hmm. the other ones haven't prioritized it, mm -hmm. and, and there's no one demanding that they do that. And so um, I'm not sure how that, how well that works. It's about as much as I can tell you. That's great. But I'm happy to get questions answered for you if you want, um, for sure. Okay. Fred, we're looking Thank at you. coming out with some energy information, um, probably button up Vermont campaign here with Efficiency Vermont. We're going to have a We've had one meeting with Paul Markowitz, we're going to have another one on Friday. Um, this could fit very well. Now we're looking at the Harvest Festival, mm -hmm. maybe is a, a good time to come yep. out with it. Yep. It's fall, yep. know, people are here. Um, so this is, this is very intriguing. Um, is it after the first frost? Maybe. Maybe. That's, that's, that's <laughs> September 29th. Let's hold it off. <laughs> and that's when everybody all of a sudden the phone starts ringing. Yeah. But sure. you, you are the first organization of any type that has seen this document. Great. 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 This is not very old. Yeah. And again, it's a draft. It won't change much. Um, and, uh, you know. Uh, that's great. Do with it what you will. But I think there's an opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's an opportunity yeah, for thanks. people in the area. Yeah, fabulous. With regard to the next General Assembly, I understand that you're having conversations with the executive branch and others yeah. to draft some legislation, and I guess you have an October deadline to kind of submit that. Oh, to, no. no. Oh, no. You, you the can... legislation for the first year of a biennium, it's like in March. Uh, the it be, legislation can be offered up. My effort would be, again, I'm not a presumptuous person. Um, I'm going to wait till after November 6th um, <laughs> and, and you know, keeping my fingers crossed <laughs> and making a little bit of effort too. But it's one of the first things I plan on doing was, was going to see uh, the woman who um, was uh, Phil Scott's advocate or person that of interest in this particular area. Everyone has their little cubby holes. Yeah. I might and, have met her at that tiny house thing. Um, you might have. Brittany is her first name. Her last name is going to escape me. I just going yeah. to call her Brittany. But I'm going to work on that. And Paul Costello, who's mm -hmm. been a big ally in this, I don't know if you know Paul, yes. he's Sounds head of rural right. Vermont and is, was excited and was involved in the Energy Commission as well. Um, there's some, you know, Neil Lunderville was a, a significant uh, player in the Republican Party for years. He's head of Burlington Electric Department. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some people that believe strongly in this. So I think there could be some good things that come in weatherization. I, I don't want to be presumptuous. You just never know. He, Scott's got to get reelected, yeah. you know. Uh, so, but, but it's one of the things that I plan on doing first off. Um, and grants, grant related. And yes, grant and I think related, that's yeah. important yeah. for low income people. So is Just like the program that, you know, what CBOEO does. That I think that there's got to be a chunk of money that way. Because there, there are people that will not be able to borrow mm -hmm. four, seven, twelve, five sure, yeah. to do what might be necessary in the place. Can Bristol Energy Committee provide you with some ideas that you would help? Absolutely, absolutely. Could, could you even present a letter to the governor from Bristol Energy Committee relating those ideas? Sure. Thank you. Good. Fair if I good. think they're reasonable. <laughs> 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 I was waiting for the answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know they will be. Right? Open the treasury. <laughs> I want to go back to the uh, the education part of it. Um, I spent 30-some years uh, in New York State as a professor. And one of the things that, that 
really bothered me in the SUNY system uh, was, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, which is the fact that there often isn't a really good connect between demand out in the workplace and what programs are being offered from high school to college and so on. Is there, first of all, it would seem to me it would be really useful to see what what our colleges, technical colleges and technical high schools are doing and see how that links up with the demand and where it falls short. So we know from what we heard today that uh, the building trades uh, kind of across the board are challenged. Yes. Uh, but certain areas are likely to come up in that regard. Knowing that, could we incentivize, say, a, a Hannaford Career Center and provide some incentives to students um, to enter into these programs. I know Matt's dad and I talked about that quite a bit and uh, and Dave Sharp uh, was chair of the education yeah, right, committee right. and he had a great deal of frustration I know. in terms of trying to work um, the career centers into a better place with ideas like this. I know there was a workforce development bill that I think got passed. Yeah. I'm light on all the details on that. Mm -hmm. The menu is pretty full up there. I mean, just the budget yeah, yeah. itself was 400 and some odd pages. And, and that may be the biggest Did bill. Did you read but it all? <laughs> but but ma many of them, well, I made sure I read page nine. I think, <laughs> where the, well, I made sure I found that darn weatherization thing on section <laughs> seven, <laughs> um, which is where it appeared. Um, uh, I skimmed it. But it's, yeah, sure. It, sure. it's difficult. Yeah. But there's efforts been made there. And for one reason or another, given all the push and pull and the prioritizations and the demands on people's times and focuses, I don't think the, the good work has been done in that area to the extent I know that Dave would have liked to have mm -hmm. had it done, or I and others. Um, uh, it, 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 you know, well, I was on the Career Center Board for years. And I maintained, especially when we became our own independent school district, which we did, only one of three career centers, because, because the Union High School in Middlebury ran it, and they didn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. You know, it was ancillary. It used to be the place that all the trouble kids were right. sent. Right. Mm -hmm. And it still has a little bit of that stigma. Yeah. Yeah. And career counselors didn't, many didn't do a good job in directing people. Mm -hmm. And Mount Abe and, and, and Regens didn't want to send kids to to a career center because it costs them money, you know, and, and so there are barriers and all those things have to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but I've often said that uh, until you make career centers either part of a grant, and, and the, the th you have one superintendent's office and you have the county as a district with the career centers a part of it, or you make, maybe there's less career centers but they're standalone high schools where they can issue a diploma for people. And kids can go there knowing they're going to get a high school diploma. I don't know whether there's an easy path to make them as valuable a tool as possible. In a small state like Vermont, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, full-time equivalent students, I think, at the Career Center is like 125 kids. It's not a lot. I know. Mm -hmm. More up in Essex, which is where, where Dave taught. Um, Rutland has a real good center and a good number of kids. I can't speak to others. But that is a wonderful resource. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. I was at um, their makers rollout on Monday night, um, and what I what I saw, and I've been in the career center before, um, was really a, a group of people in a facility looking for a mission right now. Mm -hmm. So there's there's great opportunity. Yes, there's there great is. opportunity. And and. Uh, Something has to change, and I think people recognize it, but knowing the formula to do it, it's not, I don't know that it's an easy path. I don't have a silver bullet there. I don't know that career centers should be training weatherization, you know? I think they should just be training like basic skills, problem solving and familiarity with tools and things like that. They need to do that. If you, if you train people for specifically weatherization and this kind of work, and put them out there, and the demand's not there, they're going to sure. fizzle. Sure. 
Well, it could, be, a con- it could be part of a construction trade thing. Right. Where they yeah. get a little bit of electrical, they get a little bit of plumbing, right. they get a little bit of weatherization, and they have the opportunity then, should, should this interest them. Because I tell you, are. there's contractors out there, and if the work becomes available, that void will get filled because mm-hmm. you can make money doing this. Mm-hmm. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. You can make real money doing sure. this. Sure. Sure. Well, but it's not going to, it has to be a pull. It can't be, you, know, you can't push uphill. Nope. Okay. Well, the Career Center, their, their building trades program, they literally built a home from foundation up. Yeah. Over two or three semesters. I think they, I think they two or three before the program right. kind of shut so down. The, so the kids that were was, uh, there got it. They got it from Bristol, the foundation, yeah. right through electric. You remember the Get Nines Gate, the guy's name from Bristol? Right. He was a Bristol kid. He lived up on 17. And I know his mom and dad. Who's there now? No, he's not. Oh, okay. Wow, that's okay. What is, yeah. uh, I had an electrician, you know, uh, a student from Mount name, right? Aid, who was in a, like a 2 3 program. Do you know about that? Yeah, I was very impressed. My electrician uh, had a kid working for him. And he was going to Mount A, I think it was three days a week, and apprenticing two days a week. Mm. Very good, very dedicated kid. I talked to him for quite a while because I'm interested in this stuff. And he said, I wouldn't be in school if it weren't for this program. Um, yeah. That's a state, and that, that, that's the apprenticeship program. Mm-hmm. That's how you get a license in the state. Right. But the it was, only way it was something that Mount A was doing. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's through the Department of Labor. Yeah. A lot of a lot of students um, got through school because of the Career Center. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there was a fellow who I worked with many of them. Yeah, that's good. There was a fellow who gave testimony at a school board meeting. This was back early on when we first became a district, and I remember Lynn Cole was the director, and and I was a Bristol delegate, and uh, and we brought along a couple of students, and I'll I'll never forget it was a student who was in the forestry program with Bill Scott, yeah. who's since retired, and he said, you know, I struggled with math and English my entire school career, but when I was able to use that to something that I got excited about right. and had to learn mm-hmm. those things, it took on a new meaning for me. These are my words rather yeah. than his, but it took on a new meaning for me. And the, and the career center basically saved my butt. And, and I found something I really like that I'm gonna pursue. And, and I know that happens because everyone learns mm-hmm. different. You know that, Mike, having mm-hmm. been in education. S- some people do learn a lot better with a more practical thing rather than being lectured to right. and the blackboard. Or and, yeah. and, and it's great to, if you can reach those kids and get them into those situations and hopefully that happens, I don't know. But hopefully it happens. Well, it goes. It, go ahead. Oh, sorry. It, it goes from why do I have to learn it to I want to learn this. Right. Yeah. In right. fact, I want to learn more. There are great yeah. cases. Bill Scott's program, case in point, where a young man goes there, and um, not only did he really enjoy what he was learning there, but he asked Bill, "I want to know more about starting a business. Mm-hmm. I want to know about bookkeeping." I want to know, and so he built, mm-hmm. and he has um, had started, um, and is still going a very successful sugar making operation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and there's a lot of stories like that. Actually. Sure, sure, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you for having me. Sure, yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Good luck. Yeah, thank yeah. You. thanks. <laughs> So let's move on. We're running. We have, uh, <laughs> working through the evening. Um, so minutes. If people have a chance to look at the minutes I sent to them that Sally wrote up from our last meeting. Any issues? I looked at them, but I wasn't here last time, so I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you approve them. <laughs> I approve. <laughs> they look pretty good to me. So. I think they're fine. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we can uh, we can send those through and put them on the website. Um, so our current business 
Uh, we've got the uh, electric vehicle uh, program. So I've been working on that. Uh, the, it was going to be released in early July. It still hasn't been released yet. So there's still a state still working on whatever they need to work on for that particular program. Um, I talked to uh, Gary uh, and asked certain specific questions. He was willing, uh, Gary Holloway uh, at the state, um, who we deal with for the downtown organization, um, it's, it's going through his agency. So I asked him specific questions about uh, the program and he gave me uh, fairly decent answers. Um, the main things were in terms of, we, the last time we met, we talked about what kind of chargers do we want to have level two or, or the fast charge. Um, and we sort of were looking at level two only because of costs uh, and this, the, the type of equipment. He was talking about um, maybe having a mix so you're not, you don't feel that you're limiting people who have electric vehicles. Um, you know, our, our thinking at that time was that level two, you're, you, it's a four hour charge or three and a half depending on the vehicle. It's keeping people in town, but that actually might turn people away mm -hmm. not knowing that, oh, or knowing that they can't get a 40 minute charge uh, on their car. So he, he recommended doing both. And because it's 100% cost, uh, you know, paid yeah. through the state, uh, through that program, if it's uh, on municipal land, whether it's a 10 to 15 for a level two or a 50 for a level or the fast charger, it doesn't really matter uh, to us since we're not, we're not paying a percentage for that. Um, um, one of the things is there are more cars on the road that take the not fast charge. Correct. So that percentage matters, so we'd be, you know, we have to think about that too. Right. Okay. Having, having both, we cover every, everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. There are a lot of cars that take the fast charge with adapters. Um, I think most of the newer ones. Um, but you're right. We need to reach as many people. Yeah, we'll sell yeah. them without the new ones anymore. Right. Special order, maybe. And I think, yeah, I think, I think we'll be moving. I mean, obviously, it's so like you said, are going to move towards the fast charge. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, but having having a level two that can serve uh, two spaces, having a dual unit mm -hmm. with two plugs. Um, and then having a single fast charge unit yeah, for a third great. space seems like the way to go, and that's what Gary was sort of recommending that we do. Um, so three, three. Slides. Yes, yeah. So I think around, you know, I talked about the the, I guess it's the uh, south. No wait, uh, west the west corner of the park. Um, near the Peace Garden. Near the Peace Garden. Not not parking. Uh, those diagonal spots, but on the on the uh, West Street side, yeah. mm -hmm. using those first mm -hmm. three spots mm -hmm. seems like that would be the best location. So that's what we want to we're going to yeah. present, I think. Um, and I, it's different than our previous proposal, which was on the other side of the park, sort of opposite where Park uh, Street Dental is now. Yeah. Um, and those they were less heavily used the last time we talked about this project five years ago, and now they're more heavily used yeah. because there are new businesses there yes. using those spaces. And you also have the issue of the infrastructure would have had to have been on the actual park versus here by do it using this space. It's on the green space yeah. between the sidewalk uh, and the park. So that gives that's another benefit to us. Um, so the so let's see what else did I talk to Gary about? It was the the charging. What it costs? They co they cover 100% of the cost. We the town would be responsible for maintenance and setting up the payment structure for the people coming in and using it, you know, credit card or whatever they're going to use. Um, we would need to figure out what equipment we wanted to use. And that's, I'm going to start, I've, I've gotten some details from Middlebury uh, who put in their EV system, which was Green Mountain Power, but they're going to, you know, there are a bunch of different companies now that do the level two as well as the fast charge. Um, so I'll, I'll try, I'm going to reach out to Green Mountain Power to see who they're using and what equipment they recommend because we need to know what happens if someone vandalizes it what's the repair cost or something like that um, how long do these units last um, that kind of thing we might contact drive, drive electric too they, okay i would think they'd have some information on that okay like dave roberts or okay oh i've talked to dave roberts yeah dave roberts who who i worked with before yeah. five years ago on on this project so i'm sure a lot has changed in that time as well in terms of the equipment yeah um, so that, I mean, I think that, I think we have a very good, uh, case for Bristol. Um, I met with Michelle Perley, who's on the select board, 
and talk, talked with her about it a couple days ago. Um, she seemed to like the project. Um, obviously, she doesn't know how their members will vote, but she says as long as you can have uh, a detailed proposal for the select board to consider, that's, that's going to be to our benefit, to get it answering all the questions that Absolutely. she had right. about it that you know, mm -hmm. she gave to me, which was a lot in terms of longevity and, and what's the cost of the town. I mean, having it be 100% you know, in terms of installing and getting everything there, but things like, okay, so if, if we do a fast charge and we need three phase, how do we get three phase over there? Does it mean putting a new pole in? If, can we put it underground? And does Green Mountain Power cover that cost if you want to trench it over to a particular spot? Um, so we just need to start working on uh, a detailed proposal of what equipment we'd like. And I mean, it hasn't been released yet. I mean, we'll get full details when the, when the project goes live, um, but we have a lot of detail. I think we can start putting yeah. stuff together um, for the proposal um, and just figure out when we might want to put it on the select board agenda uh, to, should, to make, ask yeah. them about it. We should probably have it fully done before we mention it. And, or would that help us if we got it on to, the agenda and then we get it? Yeah. Oh, I see. Um, no, we want to have, a, have as much done as possible. Yeah. At least, at have. least to be able to answer the questions that Michelle had, yeah. and to answer the questions that we sort of have about mm -hmm. the project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're we're limited in location only because of that 100% uh, payment coverage by having municipal property. You know, there there isn't there's not a lot of great locations. You I know, feel we, locations great. I think that's the right. best thing we got going. It's just that it's just the because of the park. Oh, yeah. um, uh, stipulations that they have now and what can go on and off. That would be, that's the only thing I can see where, where some members of the like board might have issue, but I think we can make a pretty good case for that location. You know, Michelle seemed to think that location was fine and, yes. and said, yeah, the first three spots seem perfect. Yes. You know, we do have a large tree right there, so we'd have to figure out if we're putting in infrastructure, what does that mean to the tree? Is, yeah. is it small enough in terms of just simple poles that these things are mounted to? Um, we also want to look at if it's two different types of equipment because it's one type of charger and another, mm -hmm. how do we get that so there's some sort of harmonious kind of design <laughs> in terms of how those things go together? Um, Seems like one of the most important first steps is green mountain power. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they, they say, you know, well, that tree is a problem, we can't, right. we can't do power. Yeah, and I have a couple contacts at Green Mountain Power. One that came from Middlebury in terms of who put in their systems. And I don't know if, they, if Green Mountain Power put in all their systems because they have a, a bunch of the marble works down. They have those original ones that were down uh, on the Mill Street area, which is what we were sort of looking at, which are the more of the large box kind of systems that look like big gas pumps. Nowadays, the level twos are little mm -hmm. units that can just be mounted to a pole and you just need sort of to trench the power to it. Um, and even there's a Tesla one there as well, which I guess it's a level two. It. I don't think it's a fast charge because of the size of it. Um, but yeah, I can reach out. I'll continue my work on that and talk to them. I can show them photographs of the location that we're thinking about and get some of those questions answered. Um, and you know, they're, they're going to know where the three phases across were at, at Howden Hall and then how how to bring that ac across and what that might might look like, um, and do we need to put in a pole or can we do everything underground? Um, so yeah, I'll continue work on that um, and just sort of, and I, I can keep everyone updated uh, with my progress. That's great, Ian. Good Thanks work. Yeah. That. yeah. Really awesome. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, so that's the charging. Um, Richard, you talked about the button-up program. Obviously, we heard from Paul at our last meeting. Yeah. And uh, now that's sort of going live, and we want to sort of be involved, in, and also being involved in a bigger way, and not just mm -hmm. you know as a as a energy committee, but a sort of bigger municipal kind of involvement. Um, so, what are your thoughts in terms of? Well, I guess we talked to Paul Friday um, and affirmed that we want to do the button-up. I mean, we haven't really discussed formally said. Right whether we want to do it. You actually have to sign up at two levels. One of them is a button-up hero program, which is um, more uh, extensive that I think we ought to, we probably ought to go for. Right. Um, it might dovetail to some degree with some of what Fred is talking about. Uh, but my, my vision is that we introduce this stuff at the Harvest Festival. Right. Um, and along with it, the walkthrough, I think it really does make sense if 
we can get trained people to walk through, get people to accept somebody walking through and mm -hmm. giving them some ideas. We did that at our uh, at our church in South Burlington, and this is this is the harder nut to crack. The middle and upper income people, um, they're reluctant. They really are. But if you if you go at them, we've done it several different times, several different meetings, and we've gotten a number of people to agree to the work, the walkthrough, and virtually all of them then did the formal energy audit and have, have started. Um, doing the, you know, what they were surprised to find they needed to have done, right? Uh, even with newer homes. So, um, what do you think the resistance is? Is it just not of knowledge about inertia? Yeah, and and, and the price of oil. And, well, busy. yeah, yeah, it impacts busy. inertia. <laughs> price of oil impacts the inertia. Yeah, yeah, but I think. Uh, We've been we've also been doing guilt trips on people. <laughs> yeah. You really want to put that all out in the atmosphere? Um, do you, do you think when you talk to him on Friday you'll talk about oh well a training or is that going to be something after we've collected specific volunteers? We have to we have to collect those people and then say hey what can we have this training for? Well, they're yeah they're going to they will provide a training. Uh, Once we get the program. volunteers yeah. lined up, okay. Yeah, but the button-up program is something we need to we need to know more about so that we can right. begin to implement it. So that's what we'll talk about on okay. the, to so a large degree on Friday. So sorry I missed that. So do we, as a group, do we need to have an official vote on, or can we just be consensus or consent want to do. from our members I don't know how you, uh, to how explore you that? Is there anyone that doesn't doesn't well, think that we should they, explore that? They want to sign up. They want they want us to agree yeah. that we're going to do it. And I, I guess uh, I would suggest that we do that. That we formally enter into that process. What it, what it, so what is that? It costs us a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Our firstborn. Five is your commission for setting it up. Right, firstborn. <laughs> so. When I went through training, and I assume we're talking about the same training, the walkthroughs, um, it was really a number countywide. It was, in, it was in Middlebury. It was at the, was it at the college. No, it was at the uh, regional. Oh, that's right. That's right. Mm. That's right. But it, it was. Um, but it was uh, um, energy committees from Weybridge and you know this whole area, mm -hmm. and. Maybe if we contacted those other energy committees and yeah. see if they were interested, and did they have parties? Because I'm sure there's turnover, been turnover. Since oh yeah. I don't know how recently any of those other committees have met to do that, but that would make it, I think, more effective if mm -hmm. so. If we people coordinate with them, yeah, do a five towns, yeah, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, you should yeah. talk to Paul about that because they they might be organizing yeah. it in a regional yeah. way. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, he would certainly know. Yeah. Yeah. That's why. yeah, Paul wants to kind of make Bristol a focal mm -hmm. point, so I think we've got something going for us. Yeah. Well, we've connected with the Starksboro Energy Committee with regard to what the, the we had a meeting with them a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> uh, with Patrick Green at the ANASU regarding they're looking at doing an energy audit of the elementary school in Starksboro. <coughs> The outcome of that meeting was that Patrick felt maybe to open it up and do a sort of a five town wide of the six mm -hmm. buildings that are now in the unified district. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to be connecting with those energy committees anyway mm -hmm. because of that particular project. So this seems like another another perfect opportunity. Bristol should yeah. be doing that with any every building it owns, shouldn't it? Right. And that's that's, that's something that we're we'll, gonna yeah. talk about. Too. That's one of the many things that are on our list. I'm trying to keep it keep it <laughs> Small at the moment, so we don't get completely overwhemmed and, it, and implode. Here. Yes, yeah. and I think the button-up program is, is sort of the start of that. Right. Um, right. We need to as, as the button-up hero, what is that? What's the difference between that and just the normal button-up? Is the hero because it's an organization? Yeah, I'm or? To, I was just looking it up quickly, okay. but um, I should have brought that with me, and I can't find it quickly enough. Maybe yeah, we can look. We can look too. Yeah. But yeah, we'll talk with him on Friday and then. But it seems like we're all we're all in agreement 
in terms of pursuing that and talking to Paul about it a bit more, uh, and then we can maybe yeah, we can go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and are we looking in terms of our all of our members being involved in training in terms of the walkthrough, or or I don't know. We'll what 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 works in terms of our group? I mean, it seems like in Bristol Energy Committee. Yeah. I mean, does does it seems beneficial to all of us. I mean, it seems like you've had training, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, is it something that you need to be you retrained on? I mean, listen, probably. Oh, I think thing. I think absolutely it would be helpful to okay. to do it again. Okay. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I did a walk through with Matt and um, did another with Bob Donis. And, okay. Uh, it was great. One of the things, and I know this is down the road a bit, but <clears throat> I, after we did them, I never felt we did a really good follow up right. on either of those walkthroughs. You know, we had gave the information, and yeah. I have no idea if anything ever happened. Yeah. You know, but both parties seem well qualified. At um, one of the two people in one home was very excited about it, and uh, <laughs> I felt that the woman that we spent time with was pleased that we did that and had some ideas. And but I have no idea what ever came of it. Right? Yeah, I don't either. No. So I think it's important that we, you know, when we build this out, that yeah. we, we definitely have follow-up. And if people need support in taking the next step, I think we should offer to do that. Okay. And that's something we can check in with the, the <clears throat> Middlebury folks who are doing that whole neighborhood program. So they've been, they might have ideas about how to... Sure, a lot of the energy committees have had success. And I'd love yeah. to know how... They may understand. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um. I, I would encourage, I don't know how much all of you know about all the different programs and services that are out there, but I would encourage the energy community to educate themselves on all that. I'm not sure how much will come with that from a training yeah. from, mm -hmm. from Paul. I mean, you'll certainly get some, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of different avenues homeowners can go down. I mean, whether it's Asian Agency is one of them, Efficiency and Watch Home Performance is one of them, NeighborWorks kind of is a gateway to the Home Performance program. Um, there's stuff happening with Tier 3 that, depending on which utility, you're in, I guess Bristol, we, we know it's GMP. Right. But, um, and they have their own offerings. So well, and then the, the, the group out of West Shortland who were, who were at the Heat Squad. The Heat Squad were at the, the training that I attended. Yep, uh, right. And they were presenting their what they their did. program. What yeah, they did. That, was, yeah. that was very cool as well. <clears throat> yeah, it's almost like uh, you just get this this muddle of all these acronyms. That's right. sort of around. I'm yeah. trying to like yeah. sort yeah. Right. who are these and what does yep. this all mean? Yeah. Yeah. So part of what so we have to do. Point we're we'll taken. I think. At the uh, harvest festivals, have this information in some clear form. Definitely. Uh, and that's one of the things I want to work on. <coughs> okay. I think we should make sure we get whatever information is out there already, so we're not right. doing the wheel. Because right. you know, there's things things are handed out that have a lot of that information. We just need to. Well, are we looking? Are we as a committee looking to put links to that for for people who live in Bristol, or are we just is it just knowledge for ourselves? Like we're never going to be able to connect ourselves with all the programs. I mean, we could just spend all our time doing that. Right. Um, yeah, if you're doing walkthroughs though, and you're in somebody's house, how are you going to advise them right. what path to take if you don't know what the choices are? Right. Yeah, we do right. need to know. That. I mean, you yeah, could. Yeah, have that list. Yeah. And so, so how do you? How are you? Are you building that list because of the training that you're getting, or is it just that's just you can't do, you can't cover that much? In the type of training that that members of this committee might get, is that what you're saying? The, so yeah, the walkthrough is going to be more of just the house and how. I think you, stuff. yeah, I think that's going to be mostly the training. But then there's also going to be, and hey, there's this program right. you know, okay. from Efficiency right. Vermont, and there's this program um, from Vermont Gas. You know, now they're yeah. players, yeah. So, yeah. so that's um, two different directions somebody can go. And the right. more paths they have, the less likely they are to act. Unless they know, right? Yeah, that's right. That, know that's what I was wondering. Like, right. In terms of like, yeah. you know, do we put a link to fifty things on the website? No, like, hey, we went to this walkthrough. No. Just check our site, and then that's there's like, that's why I'm um, saying 
whoever the volunteers are need yeah. to be educated on, yeah. on yeah. those options. To have right. an idea of what that what they might be best fitted. Yeah. So we've got to we've got to talk to everybody. Be a really good source. He is right. a really good source because they seem to you know having gone to the you know the convention and all. Right. I mean, there, we can, yeah. There's all sorts of different organizations that are represented there. You know, and that right. you could. I mean, I wandered from you know workshop to workshop listening to multiple different organizations and what they do around the state. So I would think VCAN would really have their finger on the right. ones. And, and also, Ian being sort of liaison with energy committees, right. he would also be a great resource to say, based on his experience, and I actually should talk to my son who did that job previously, just say, who were the organizations that you felt energy committees found most helpful right. to homeowners? Yes. You know, like, so you can kind of like, distill it down a little right. bit. Yeah. Here's some other options, but these have been known to be the best options. Okay. And you bring it to a local level is the other hard part. So you might see right. you know, somebody out in the Upper Valley had a great experience with the XYZ organization, but that's yeah. not an option for us. Yeah, we yeah. have to know so, what our local So VCAN is. is actually administering but not... Uh, right, so we already so, have. Okay. So there's weatherization, upgrade equipment, okay. hot water efficiency. Um, checklists and things yeah. like that. So there's a lot of information that we can pull out. Yeah. Okay. And then I think we need to we need to provide a, a very graphic way to lead somebody through it. If you need this, here's where you could look. Right. That kind of thing. So it isn't. We you don't want to give a specific person one or two options. Pardon? You don't want to give everybody a big list. Right. You want to give. A specific homeowners. Yeah. yeah, we have to be careful. The though. best one or two yeah. options. Right. Yeah. yeah. But Try I, these if you. If I you think have we have to be back. careful um, as a committee that we don't favor certain yeah. Yeah. contractors over somebody else. So right. So well, we'll, we'll have yeah. to be cognizant. Yeah, I, that. I appreciate that too. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So Maybe there, if somebody qualified for weatherization, I'm certainly going to prioritize. The free weatherization program over efficiency or Oh yeah, well you, it's doing right. the best thing yeah. for the customer, right. for the customer for the oh, yeah. owner. So if right. you get it down to one or two things, then you know is it Vermont gas or efficiency Vermont? Yeah, I use right. I use building energy for my project. We did the the whole thing, and uh, efficiency Vermont gave us the rebates, and um, from my personal experience, it worked great. Yeah. yeah, getting to the contractor level is a little like I don't think we even need to do that because right. it's the program. No. Different contractors insert themselves into different programs. So if you're okay. a Vermont Gas program, you have the set of contractors that you're allowed to yeah. use. If you're a Fishes Vermont program, okay. you have those lists. I think it's really about which program. Like, oh, yeah. and it's yeah. one of the hardest things for a consultant to do is you know, are you going to hook up to natural gas? Oh, maybe. Okay, well, <laughs> right. And the answer is maybe call them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, well, is Vermont Gas going to offer any? Cause I think they were doing it farther south in Rutland that they were offering to come in and do their program if somebody was going to sign up to switch. Correct. Yes. They would convert. They'll, they'll do that. Yeah. They will do a free audit for you. So they do that in Bristol. If they, they will. If you, if you commit to. to yeah. Um, but that's that project is still a couple of years away, but you know they're going to start. You know they've been having information sessions. I went to one of them and talked to them about the equipment, and they have to go back to fifty, and that could add a lot of time. Well, yeah, but they were starting to do the audit. They've, they've already started doing yeah. audits out of their turf. Right, right. So yeah. I don't know if they're starting to do that here now or uh, if it would be not yet, to, but, but probably soon. Yeah, uh, but but you need yet, no, right? but they but they need a commitment from a homeowner to sign up, which they can't they can't get yet, because there there isn't the guarantee of them being here. You know the the select board is still working on the license yeah, agreement, and then there's Act 250. So, and I don't know if, if as they're doing Act 250, if they can be they can't do anything right until they get. They've been doing a whole lot. Right. I mean, that's about, yeah. Well, Act, 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 Act 250 is unique to Bristol because it's, it's known as like a one-acre 
town. Mm. They haven't done Act 250 on any other, any other Addison uh, town apart from Bristol. It's because the di distribution is just over an a couple mile or an yeah. acre, an acre I think it is, yeah. As it's, far a, as it's a particular thing, because mm. I, I asked them at that meeting, yeah. and I said, well, you've done the Act 250 before, is that an easy process? And they said, well, this is the first time we're doing it. Bristol's the only one that requires it. Interesting. So, mm. yeah. But, but they did say that that could, you know, if someone appo appeals it or opposes their, their Act 250 permit then, or application, then it obviously takes a lot longer for them to get here. So we'll see. Um, can you talk a little about the community energy dashboard you mentioned? Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, brighter, brighter Vermont has a community energy dashboard. Um, and actually, it goes town by town. So here's Bristol, um, and you can get information on Brighter Energy Vermont, Brighter Energy Vermont and it, it projects oh, okay. as we're going now, are we going to meet the energy goal of 90% uh, right. efficiency? And a lot of that's built on, built on what we've done as a town and what individuals have done, property yeah. owners. Okay, so oh, the yeah. more information we can feed into this, the better that's going to look. Instead of just looking completely flat or, or so, going nowhere near where we need to be. So we're going to want to like, like, encourage going. residents. Okay. It's like yeah. all up and down the street, there are solar panels. Yes. Okay, I know no, none of those people entered it into the energy dashboard. Right. So the information that's on here is way out of date. Yeah, you know, very Just complete. Doing that yeah, would be great yeah. going around and getting yeah. the data for this. I search for me, and I'm on there for my geothermal, uh, and I'm the only one yeah. that, that has uh, well, ground been... source geothermal. A lot of people have our newer ones, but also there's a lot of people I know, like all of the co-housing all has heat pumps, yes. and yes. none of none of those are in there. No, uh -huh. I tried to get on, and I heat pump pump just, I registered Did you put two weeks ago. Yourself? Yeah, yeah. Blocked. yeah, yeah it's in there. Yeah, you have to put it in your job. Yeah. That's where, in where? The, in this dashboard. dashboard. Yeah. Oh, the dashboard. Yeah. You can you log can, in. Yeah. Anyone can create a account. Yeah, log in. Say you're from Bristol, here's my account. You can say what you did. I did, you know, check the boxes. Yeah. When, so, when you say the, the dashboard for, I'm, I'm sorry I was writing something here, so I missed the first part of this. So the, the reason I'm asking is we're, we're having an array put on our barn here in the next couple of weeks. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, um, so it's on, what's the website that it's on? So the website is uh, vermontenergy-dashboard.org. Oh, okay. But it's, con it's connected with... It's connected with, with the brighter. brighter Vermont. Yeah. 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 Um, so all spelled out, Vermont Energy? Vermont Energy I mean, I'll send links to it. Yeah. Okay. And there, some, some of the information is in there and you can see it and you can say, are you the owner of this? Can you, you can claim it. So some must come in from some other, maybe it was many years ago, because this has been running, I think, for a number of years now. Yeah. Um, you can claim, or you can create your own account and then start adding. Um, and maybe we can, maybe I'll, I'll take a look at this and see. I mean, this, okay, so it has to be individual. I just wondered if, if um, like Green Mountain Power, would, like if you, you know, you get a statement from Green Mountain Power, right. and it where says, they're using that information. Or, you know, how many kilowatts you had to run, yeah. and whether they put that there. This is more. It's a question from Paul. It's, yeah. it's like a long checklist. It says, um, "How do you heat your house?" And you check the box. Oh, okay. How yeah. do you do this? And you check. And how do you yeah. have you done this? And you know. Yeah, it's it's yeah. less of like sort of a, a raw. We were trying to yeah. yeah, it's less of like a. Less of a, lot of a raw data collector and more of just information about the en energy infrastructures that are in your town, right. and the, and it, and it's it's using the projection that Vermont has, and you can see where Bristol is, and all, and that projection is based on the data that it has for Bristol. So if it has no data for Bristol, it's not looking good for Bristol in terms right. of us reaching what we need to reach. Right. But the more people that use it and gotcha. plug in solar and stuff like that, then that starts to change. Yeah. Um, but it's twenty fifty. Right, exactly. Right. You know, right. so that's encouraging people to use right. that, and right. and we we should familiarize ourselves with it, so we can answer questions about it, um, mm -hmm. and encourage people to use it as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and as you build or as we build more relationships with other energy committees, we, we can do things like challenges, like hey, Star yeah. Squirrel challenges Bristol to a percent reduction right. or a drop yeah. in your, you know, mm -hmm. competition that, that motivator. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it can be a good motivator. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be a good. Apology, but I I've got to leave. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Good night. Okay. Yeah. Is that .com or .org? .org. Okay. Good night. Thanks, John. Um, Good night. So that's actually part. We're that's done bad. with our agenda. We've got a public forum. Gary, do you have any questions? <laughs> Very patient. Uh, actually, uh, just two observations that may or may not be useful in terms of uh, low-income people accessing programs that could exist, whether the loan programs or otherwise. Right. Uh, and the question, one question was, why are they not? Why, what's the difficulty? I'm wondering if, I remember when I was a poor person, which I still be, um, I was always on guard about being taken advantage of by mm -hmm. any, there was this yeah. real distrust yeah. of anything I couldn't immediately control. And so loan programs, even granting programs, are these kind of distant things. Um, so whether or not that's an accurate observation yeah. and whether or not there's a way to mitigate it. Uh, in terms of like walkthroughs and then connecting people to programs, I wonder if there's a way to put together an ambassador program mm -hmm. where there are a couple of skilled trained or partially trained uh, consultants almost. So that if, if, if Richard is a low income person and says, oh, well, I, I would have a, a walkthrough, but I, I don't know what to do with all these websites. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. So somebody to help shepherd them through right. the process to mm -hmm. at least a level of accomplishment. Which I think is the direction we're going in, in terms of signing up. For the button-up program and, and getting training, yeah, I, I think, think it's a sort correct. of it's re, rebuilding the energy committee and having that mm -hmm. having that be the trusted resource. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's great. Right. Hopefully, well, and if if I'm hearing you correctly, it may go to what I was saying earlier about the follow-up. I mean, if you yeah. if you get right. in yeah. to a home, then you know, getting you know, a month later, three weeks later, just checking in and. You know, can we help? Because by then they've processed and they've looked at yeah. stuff and they go, or yeah. lead them through it. Because yeah. I know when I go online and look at a form, and I'm not stupid. Yeah. The first thing I do is go, "Are you kidding?" <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, is so somebody to help to literally moment to moment. Yeah. Well, we could set yeah. up. We could find volunteers. I, really I think it. in the library, for example, we could set up sometime during the week or when. One of us will be there mm -hmm. to help right. people with a computer, mm -hmm. help them through it. And also just understand what, what, yeah. what of, of these millions of possibilities, right. yeah. what are the appropriate ones. Yeah. If you can get them to, I think Matt, you said it, if you can get them to do one thing, um, it usually leads to something else. You know? So what's, what's the thing in a walkthrough that just might, might tip the balance? Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully that's part of what the training will provide. Yeah, right. And, and I would offer that, you know, it, I'd love to help any way I can, but if it's helpful to be a mentor to those who get trained to go mm -hmm. out to the first visit or the second or to yeah. come and do a remedial training after the other training, yeah. just to, like, yeah. Yeah, get it great. honed in and, uh, you know, be a resource for everyone else. Well, I will reaffirm that doing that visit with you was extremely helpful to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that's okay. That's Great. Good. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. All right. You get to be on the clock when you do stuff like that, right? <laughs> Not stuff like that, maybe, but. <laughs> no. Damn. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. So, um, Sally, you're good. We're adding up the minutes yeah. for this. Uh, our next meeting will be August 15th. Um, are we still happy with the 7.30 time frame? I'm good with that. I okay. mean, I could start a little earlier if people were comfortable with that, but that's fine. Yeah, I can start earlier. I could start well, earlier. Okay, okay, most people are used to 7. Yes. I, have, I saw Fred at about 7.10. He's like, is the meeting tonight? And I was like, yeah, 7.30. <laughs> well, I think it's confusing to have it at 7.00. Uh, especially when it says 7 o'clock on the website, yeah. the town website. Uh, or you, at least it used to. It used, it it used to, yeah. It was also it was the wrong day as well. Um, oh, okay. I'm also going to check on the what's above us for this meeting, and yeah. it may it may determine where our location is because yeah, yeah. that's not a if that's a, a you know at every third for every third Wednesday event that's not something we want to be yeah. below. Right. Um, so I'll I'll look at a possible new location. I'll I'll ask Meredith what the schedule is um, just to see. I mean even having it 
you know, in one of our meetings is kind of uh, disrupting. How is the, uh, how's the sound? Could you actually... Uh, pretty annoying. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'll work on that, but I, if everyone's okay with moving it to seven, I'll do that, and then that sort of jives with the majority of meetings that are held in the evening. Uh, you want to reserve us a uh, space at the uh, Harvest Festival? Yes, I will do that. I'll talk to uh, Rob about that. Yeah. What's the recurrence of the meetings? Every Wednesday, every third month? Wednesday. Every third Wednesday. Wednesday. Every Wednesday. At 7 p.m. in yeah. as, as yet undetermined location. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.